My name is Ellis Carver, and this happened to me on October 12, 2003, out in Olympic National Forest, Washington State. Been a ranger all my life, just like my dad and his dad before him. I know these woods like the back of my hand. Seen plenty of things tourists never will. Bears, bobcats, even the odd wolf passing through. Nothing ever truly dangerous, though. At least, not until that day. Now, this part of the forest is remote. We're talking no cell service, barely a signal for the radio. That's why my partner and I mostly stick together on patrol, especially if there's been a report of trouble. That morning was one such case. A group of campers hadn't made their scheduled check-in. Could be nothing, but it's our job to investigate. My partner's Dale Flynn, a good guy, bit of a jokester, but knows his stuff too. We hike in, following the trail to their last known campsite. Place is empty, tent still set up. No sign of a struggle, no trash left behind like a bear got into their things. Just gone. That's when we start getting a bad feeling. Dale suggests we split up. Cover more ground. I don't like it, but he's right. We agree to stick within shouting distance and check in over the radio every twenty minutes. We head out, me going deeper into the trees, Dale circling wide towards the south. It's slow going, terrain full of brush and fallen logs. I'm calling out for the missing campers, half expecting them to wander out of the bushes, confused and hungover. An hour passes, and the hairs on the back of my neck start to prickle. Too quiet. No birdsong, no squirrels rustling in the leaves. Even the wind seems to have died. And Dale, he hasn't answered a radio check in a while. I try again. Dale? Come in, Dale. Over. Static crackles back. I break into a cold sweat. That sinking feeling in my gut intensifies. Something's wrong. I shout his name, my voice cracking in the unnatural silence. Nothing. Then I see it. A flash of movement up ahead through the trees. A figure, tall and hunched over. At first, I think it's just Dale. I move closer, calling his name again. But as the figure steps into a patch of sunlight, I freeze. This ain't Dale. It ain't even human. The thing is massive, at least seven feet tall. Covered in thick, dark fur, arms so long they almost drag on the ground. But it's the face that haunts me. Like a man, but twisted. Huge jaw jutting out, filled with yellow teeth. The eyes, small, black, glinting in the dim light. Intelligent. It notices me, lets out a low growl that rattles my bones. I try for my radio, but my fingers fumble. The thing lunges, moving with impossible speed for something its size. I trip, scramble backwards on the damp earth. I see a flash of claws and then pain. White hot, searing pain across my chest. It roars, a sound that's both animal and something far, far worse. I try to scream, but all that comes out are choked gurgles. The creature looms over me, reeking of rotten meat. It raises a massive paw, the claws glistening in the half-light. My time is up. I close my eyes, bracing for the end. And then, gunshot. The report echoes through the trees, and the creature jerks back with a snarl. I open my eyes. There's Dale, standing a dozen feet away, rifle raised. Another shot rings out, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It roars in fury, then turns and bolts into the undergrowth, disappearing with shocking agility. Dale rushes over, dropping to his knees beside me. I try to speak, but blood bubbles from my mouth. He shakes his head, face pale. 
Ambulance is on the way, Ellis. Just hang on, he says, but I know we both hear the lie. I look up at the canopy of trees overhead, dappled sunlight filtering through. Such a beautiful place to die. I feel a wave of darkness wash over me, and my vision starts to fade. Dale's voice sounds far away now. Then faintly I hear it. A rustling in the bushes. Branches snapping. The patter of heavy footsteps closing in. Dale doesn't seem to hear it at first. His eyes are focused on me, pleading. But then his head whips around, and his expression shifts to horror. Ellis! Close your eyes! Don't look! He yells. There's a tremor in his voice, the kind I've never heard from him. I don't have the strength to obey, but I hardly need to. The creature bursts out of the undergrowth, a blur of fury. It doesn't go for me, though. Dale fires his rifle again, a desperate shot that goes wide as the creature barrels into him. They hit the ground with a sickening thud, Dale's scream cutting short. It's a blur of fur and teeth and blood. Dale thrashes, manages to throw a punch, but it's like a mosquito against a buffalo. The creature raises him off the ground one-handed, then slams him against a tree. There's the sound of bone snapping, and Dale goes limp, eyes wide and staring at nothing. Pure animal instinct kicks in then. No thought, just move. I push myself up, the pain in my chest beyond description. The creature is occupied, ripping and tearing at Dale's lifeless body. I stumble a couple of steps, reaching for my pistol where it fell, then I'm falling. My legs give out. I hit the damp ground, and that's when I see it, a thick branch ripped from a sapling. It's long, sharp at the broken end. A weapon if I'm desperate enough. The creature turns, a snarl curling its lips back from those bloody teeth. It sees me, registers that I'm still a threat. Or maybe it just wants more. I know I have seconds, maybe less. It charges, a terrifying sight. But I'm not helpless anymore. With an agonized grunt, I push myself onto one knee, raising the broken branch like a spear. The creature's almost on me, the stench of it overpowering, its monstrous eyes filled with single-minded hunger. Then, it impales itself on the branch. The momentum carries it forward, the sharp point ripping through its chest and out its back with a wet, tearing sound. Its roar morphs into a surprised gurgle. I fall back again, the effort nearly bringing me unconscious. The creature thrashes against the branch, but it's a mortal wound. It collapses next to me, twitching and choking on its own blood. Then it lies still. Its small, dark eyes stare blankly at the sky. I did it. I don't know how, but I did it. But then, from deeper in the trees, there's another sound. A long, mournful howl, answering the first roar and then another closer, and another. Too many to count. Panic floods me anew. Dale's wrong. I'm not going to make it. Blackness threatens to consume me. I fight it, scrambling, crawling, dragging myself along the forest floor. My breaths are ragged, my cries for help barely whispers. I have no idea where I'm going. Just the instinct to get away, to put distance between myself and the monsters that will soon be here. The pain fades in and out. I feel the cold earth beneath my fingers, smell the rich scent of decaying leaves. Then I see it. A flicker of light up ahead. The forest opens up, and there, a road. It's small, more of a gravel track than a proper road, but salvation just the same. I crawl towards it, fueled by sheer, desperate hope. I collapse at the edge of the gravel, and I don't have the energy to do more. Everything is dim, vision blurring again. Then headlights. 
A car is coming, jolting along the uneven path. I try to shout, to wave, but all I can manage is a feeble croak. The car stops. Doors slam, and there are voices. Concerned voices asking if I'm hurt. My blood-soaked ranger uniform is answer enough. Someone calls for help, a voice trembling on a cell phone. It's going to be all right, they say. Help is on the way. I want to believe them. But I also hear the rustle of leaves in the forest, the snapping of twigs. They're coming closer. The headlights illuminate the tree line, casting long, sinister shadows. I try to tell them to get back in the car to run. My mouth works but nothing comes out. A dark shape emerges from the woods, then another and another. Small eyes glint back at me in the harsh glare of the headlights. The people with me gasp in fear. One of them starts to scream. I close my eyes. I don't want to see what happens next. I wake up in a hospital bed. Clean sheets, the smell of disinfectant. My head is pounding, and my chest feels like it's on fire. But I'm alive. Alive but not alone. Janice, my friend from the ranger station, sits by my bed. There are dark circles under her eyes. She forces a smile, but it trembles as she reaches for my hand. They found you on the side of the road, she says, her voice thick. A couple of hikers. You were barely conscious. Dale. Dale didn't make it, Ellis. The news hits me like a physical blow. Grief and guilt wash over me in a numbing wave. She talks about the rescue team that went in, about how they found Dale's body, and what was left of the creature I killed. There are more questions, so many questions. What was it? How many are there? Why? The doctors and the police come, asking me to recount everything. I do, mechanically, not believing my own words. They nod, jot things down. They reassure me that the area is closed off, that they're investigating. But there's a glint in their eyes, a skepticism. I know what they're thinking, trauma victim, making up a wild story to cover what really happened to his partner. I'm released from the hospital a week later. There's a small memorial service for Dale. Afterwards, I go back to my cabin, the one I was living in before all this. I should feel safe there, but I don't. The trees stare at me accusingly through the windows. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind is a potential monster lurking at the edge of my awareness. I try to get back to work, to routine. But it's impossible. The rangers look at me with pity like I'm a ticking time bomb. They whisper when I'm not around. Out in the woods, every shadow, every snap of a twig sends a jolt of terror through me. I jump at every sound, gun always in hand, sleep in impossible luxury. The nightmares come. Vivid, horrifying dreams of the creature, of Dale's death. They replay over and over, a torture without end. I start to drink. It's the only way to dull the pain, to stop the relentless churn of fear and guilt in my gut. They let me go, of course. Say it's best for all concerned. I don't fight it. I barely acknowledge it. Life fragments. I drift from town to town, taking odd jobs, never staying anywhere too long. The bottle is my constant companion. The only faces I trust are at the bottom of a glass. And all the while I hear them. The rustle in the bushes, the low growl from the shadows, the echoing howls in the dead of night. I know they're out there, lurking in the wild places. Waiting. Watching. And part of me waits, too, for the day the bottle isn't enough, the day I finally meet one of those creatures again, and the nightmare ends for good.
My name is Rowan Hayes, and this happened to me on July 26, 1995. I was a ranger in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Tennessee. Grew up round here, know these woods better than my own backyard. But nothing prepared me for what I saw that day. Me and my partner, Cal Whitaker, were on a routine patrol. It had been a hot, muggy summer, more bare sightings than usual. We were following up on a report from some hikers, said they saw a cub on the trail, no sign of its mama. Now, that's a cause for concern, could mean the mother was hurt or killed, leaving an orphaned cub vulnerable. Or worse, the mama was still around and protective, Cal was a bit of a hothead, always itching for action. I'm the cautious type, figure it's what's kept me alive this long. We trekked further into the woods, the air thick with the smell of damp leaves and pine needles. We reached the spot the hikers marked, but no sign of any cub. Cal grumbled something about tourists not knowing a chipmunk from a bear. That's when we heard it. A low growl coming from deeper in the trees. I raised a hand to stop Cal, my senses prickling. That wasn't a bear cub sound. It was deeper, more guttural. Cal rolled his eyes, but at least he lowered his voice. Big bear, you think? He whispered, a touch of excitement creeping in. I didn't answer. Whatever was in there, it didn't feel right. We moved forward slowly, guns ready. The undergrowth thickened, making every step a struggle. The growling grew louder, interspersed with a strange clicking sound, like branches snapping. Then we see it, clearing ahead. And in the clearing, something inhuman. It's crouched low to the ground, it's back to us. Even at a distance, it looks huge at least twice the size of any black bear I've ever seen. Its skin is bare and wrinkled, a sickly grayish color. Its limbs are too long, ending in bony hands with long, curved claws. But it's the head that sends a chill down my spine. Massive, bald, with a long protruding snout and a gaping jaw lined with jagged teeth. And those eyes, small, black, and glinting with a chilling intelligence. Something ain't right about this creature, something that makes the hair on my neck stand on end. And then it smells us. It whirls around with breathtaking speed, its eyes locking onto us. Cal gasps, raises his rifle, and fires. The creature lets out a deafening roar, a sound that's both animal and something far, far worse but the bullet seems to do little more than annoy it. I react on instinct. Run! I shout at Cal, already turning and sprinting back towards the trail. I hear him pounding behind me, the creature's roars shaking the trees. It's gaining on us, its long legs making it terrifyingly fast, the snapping of branches growing closer with each passing second. And then Cal screams a horrible, gurgling scream that cuts off suddenly. I don't dare look back. Panic fuels me. I burst free from the tree line and onto the trail. I run until my lungs burn, until my legs threaten to give out. I risk a glance over my shoulder nothing but the thick, green wall of trees. Yet the roars continue, moving away, growing fainter. I stumble to a halt, Gasping for air, my whole body trembling. My radio I grab it with shaking hands. I manage to call for backup, my voice ragged and choked. Words spill out giant creature, attacked Cal, unknown location. It sounds insane, even to my own ears. They find me an hour later, collapsed against a tree. They find what's left of Cal a few miles deeper into the woods. It's, it's bad. Not something I can ever forget. The thing tore him apart. It didn't even eat him, just left him there, like some kind of twisted message. The aftermath is a blur. 
questions tests, the look in the eyes of the other rangers a mix of pity and disbelief. They search the woods for days, find no trace of the creature. The higher-ups chalk it up to a bear attack. Maybe a poacher got to Cal and the bear scavenged the remains. Easier to believe that than the horrifying truth I saw out there. I tried to go back to work, to pretend everything was normal. But it wasn't. The woods, they felt different. Like they were watching me, waiting to see if I'd dare come back. The nightmares started the creature's face, Cal's screams, the feeling of those dead, beady eyes on me. Sleep became a luxury I couldn't afford. I quit the park service a few months later. Couldn't handle being out there anymore. Drifted for a while, trying to bury the memories, but they always clawed their way back to the surface. Took some odd jobs, construction, security, stuff that kept me indoors, near people. Never went near a stretch of woods unless I absolutely had to. A few years back, I heard whispers. Other disappearances other sightings, in other parks. Descriptions that match that damn thing down to the chilling detail. They dismiss it. Animal attacks, feral humans, anything but the monstrous truth. Maybe I should have kept my mouth shut that day, let them write it off as some freak accident. At least Cal's death would have meant something. A warning taken seriously. But here's the thing, folks, it's out there and there might be more of them. Whatever the hell it is, it's something old, something unnatural, and God help anyone else who crosses its path. My name is Wyatt Miller, and this happened to me on October 6, 2012. Been a forest ranger in Mount Rainier National Park, Washington my whole life, just like my grandpa was. These trails, these giant trees, they're in my blood. But that day, I learned there are things in the world even the locals don't know about. Things that make you question everything. It started off routine enough, a report of a solo hiker, long overdue. Name of Amelia Kerr. Now, people get lost all the time. Tourists who don't respect the wilderness, even experienced folks who have a stroke of bad luck. But this felt different. Amelia wasn't some casual hiker. Her gear was top-notch, and she had years of experience in these mountains. Something in my gut said trouble. I set out on the trail she'd last been seen on. It was a nasty day, Rain whipping down, turning the paths into muddy messes. Visibility was poor, and aside from the odd squirrel or crow, there wasn't a living soul in sight. I kept calling out Amelia's name, my voice ragged against the wind. Nothing came back but the echo of my own shouts and a rising sense of unease. Hours passed. I was soaked to the bone, starting to lose hope. That's when I found it, a patch of broken ferns off the trail, freshly disturbed. Then, a few yards further, a smear of blood on a tree trunk, dark against the wet bark. My heart hammered in my chest. I knelt down, touched the blood, still tacky, not too old. Something was wrong. Real wrong. I drew my gun, moving slower now eyes darting between the shadows. The rain made it hard to see, hard to hear anything above the pounding of my pulse. And then, there it was a footprint. Not human, though. Much bigger, with long, clawed toes. A shiver ran down my spine. I followed the trail of prints as best I could, the rain washing some away. They led deeper into the woods, away from any trail I knew about. Adrenaline masked the exhaustion, and a sense of duty, stronger than fear, propelled me forward. I had to find Amelia, had to know what happened to her. The tracks went on for what felt like miles. 
The rain finally started to let up, but the fading light made things more treacherous. Then, up ahead, I saw a break in the trees. Not a clearing, more like a hollow. The trees circled round it, their branches skeletal against the darkening sky. And in the center, well, that's where the nightmare began. It looked like a cave at first. But as I got closer, I realized the dark opening wasn't rock. It was more like skin. Smooth, leathery, and mottled gray, with a faint, sickening pulse. My mind refused to process what I was seeing. And then came the smell, rotting meat, mixed with something fouler, something that pricked at some primal part of my brain. Before I could back away, the ground beneath my feet rumbled. The skin-like cave thing trembled, and then a slit ripped open an eye, milky white and the size of a dinner plate. It blinked, fixing me in its gaze. And that's when the creature emerged. God! I wish I hadn't seen it. Wish I could erase it from my memory. It was twice my height, all gnarled limbs and rippling muscle. Its skin. I told you, cave-like, with pulsing veins beneath the surface. The head was small for its body, bald and elongated, with a mouth that split far too wide, filled with rows of needle-like teeth. It took a step towards me. I fired a shot, more out of instinct than any hope of stopping it. The creature let out a roar that split the air, a mix of animal shriek and something far worse, something that made my bones vibrate. But it didn't slow down. I turned and ran. Blind panic took over. I scrambled through soaking undergrowth, branches whipping at my face, the creature's roars echoing behind me. I fumbled for my radio, trying to call for backup even as I knew it was useless. Help! I choked out, voice thick with terror. Unknown creature requesting immediate. The transmission cut out, filled with nothing but static. I looked up and saw the thing barreling towards me, its claws tearing through saplings like tissue paper. In that moment I knew it was over. And then... A different sound split the air, another gunshot. The creature faltered, a pained growl ripping from its throat. I risked a look back and saw it, another ranger uniform emerging from the trees, a rifle aimed steady. It was Harper, a grizzled old veteran who knew these woods as well as I did. Harper fired again. I saw the bullets hit their mark, but they did little more than annoy the creature. It lunged at him. I screamed Harper's name, but he didn't falter. He fired again and again, providing a distraction, buying me precious seconds. I scrambled to my feet, my mind kicking back in. I remembered the clearing I'd seen earlier. If I could just lead the creature there, out of the dense forest. I took off running again, shouting over my shoulder for Harper to follow me. I heard Harper pounding behind me, his labored breathing mixing with the creature's enraged bellows. The clearing seemed an eternity away, every root and rock a potential death trap. My legs screamed, lungs burned but I kept running, fueled by desperation. Finally, the trees thinned, and there it was, the open space. I burst into the clearing, scrambling towards its center. Behind me, the creature erupted from the tree line. For one awful moment, it seemed poised to bound after me. But then it stopped short, just at the edge of the clearing. It paced back and forth, letting out frustrated roars, but it didn't cross the invisible line. Harper stumbled into the clearing behind me, face pale. What the hell is that thing? He gasped. I shook my head, barely able to catch my breath. I don't know. I looked around desperately. There had to be something, a clue about why the creature wouldn't enter the open space. And then I noticed it, the bones. 
Scattered all around the clearing were piles of them, animal bones, old and weathered. Deer, elk, maybe even something bigger. It was like a graveyard, a macabre boneyard hidden deep in the heart of the forest. That's it, I said, the realization hitting me. It can't come out into the open. Something about this place. Harper looked around as if seeing the clearing for the first time. A sacred site, maybe? He sounded skeptical, but desperate. It was our only chance. I raised my rifle, taking aim at the creature. I fired, aiming not to kill, but to drive it deeper into the clearing. The bullet struck its shoulder, and it recoiled with a furious roar. We kept firing, a desperate symphony of gunshots echoing around the clearing, forcing the creature back with each hit. As it retreated, panic turned to something akin to cunning. It circled the boneyard, searching for an opening, but there was none. The clearing had become its prison. And with each passing moment, its roars grew less angry, more a low, mournful growl. Finally, it slumped to the ground in the center of the clearing, surrounded by the bones. Whether it was giving up, or dying some slow death from our bullets, I didn't know. All I knew was that the immediate danger had passed. We approached cautiously, weapons still raised. Up close, the creature was even more horrifying. Its skin pulsed with some internal rhythm, and the milky eye still tracked our movements. Harper knelt beside me, his face a mask of disgust and grudging respect. Guess we'll wait for back up here, I said, though I wasn't sure who we'd even call for this kind of thing. Wait for them to find what? Harper asked grimly, gesturing at the creature. Whatever this is, they'll cover it up. Say it was a bear attack, a hoax. He was right. The world wasn't ready for the truth of what lurked in its hidden corners. A part of me wanted to forget it too, to pretend this had been a nightmare. But the other part, the part that was a ranger, sworn to protect these woods, knew we couldn't let it go. We waited as darkness fell. The creature didn't move, its growls fading into ragged breaths. When the first flashlights cut through the gloom, it wasn't backup I'd radioed. It was the elders, the old-timers from the nearby reservation. News traveled fast in these parts, especially news this strange. They came in force, faces stoic in the flickering light. They moved around the clearing, their chanting a low hum in the night air. They recognized this place. An elder, a woman with eyes as deep as the forest pools, came to stand before us. This place is sacred, a place of balance, she said her voice rough with age. The creature, it was drawn here, bound here by old forces. She looked at the creature with a mix of pity and revulsion. It will stay. Cannot leave now. But it should not have been disturbed. The balance is fragile. And then it happened. The creature let out one final, rattling gasp. Its milky eye rolled upwards, and then it was still. The pulsing under its skin ceased. It was dead. The elders nodded solemnly. One of them produced a pouch, scattering dust from it over the creature's body. It shimmered in the flashlight beams, and then the corpse began to sink into the earth. Within minutes there was no trace of it, no blood, no bones, just the damp forest floor littered with fall leaves. It is done, the elder woman said. She glanced between Harper and me. You will remember nothing of this. Her voice held no threat, only the quiet authority of someone stating a simple, immutable fact. My mind rebelled. I wanted to argue, to demand an explanation. But even as the thought formed, it faded, replaced by a deep weariness. Harper was already lowering his rifle, a confused frown on his face. We didn't speak on the walk back. 
The elders vanished into the night, leaving an unsettling silence behind them. The incident report was vague. Lost hiker, no trace found, search called off. Amelia Kerr joined the ranks of the missing, her fate swallowed by the vastness of the wilderness. Only Harper and I shared the truth, a truth that was already blurring at the edges, fading into the realm of half-remembered nightmares. And the nightmares did come. Horrible, vivid dreams of the creature, the charnel house clearing. I left Mount Rainier soon after. Couldn't handle the sight of the trees, the oppressive silence. Took a desk job for a while, trying to convince myself I was fine. But I never really was. I spend my days now searching for answers in old books, tribal lore, forgotten scraps of knowledge. Some corner of my mind believes if I can understand what we saw that day, it will make it less monstrous, less terrifying. But the more I uncover, the more it confirms a chilling truth. There are forces at play in the world that defy explanation, creatures that exist in the shadows, content to remain unseen until they aren't. My name is Ezekiel Barnes, and this happened to me on July 7, 2008. Back then, I was working as a ranger in Yosemite National Park, California. Grew up round these parts, loved every rock and tree. But that summer, everything changed. Started off with the missing persons cases. Hikers disappearing without a trace. No bodies, no gear, nothing. Now, people get lost in the wilderness, accidents happen. But this was different. Too many disappearances clustered all around the same area, an old, rarely used trail leading to a place called Grizzly Flats. It was remote territory, the kind of place only experienced folks would even attempt. Something prickled at the back of my neck. I grew up on local legends, tales of things lurking in the deep woods. I'd always dismiss them as campfire stories. Yet, here I was, with a gnawing sense that the disappearances weren't just bad luck. That something unnatural was at play. My partner, Rayan, was a skeptic through and through. Practical, ex-military, the kind of gal who could track a bear through a blizzard. When I mentioned my suspicions, she rolled her eyes. Zeke, probably just some drifter preying on unsuspecting tourists. She drawled. Still, we were duty-bound to investigate. We got permission to hike the trail to Grizzly Flats. Armed to the teeth, sure, but that was standard protocol when venturing into the deep backcountry. Started off bright and early, the air crisp and the birds singing classic Sierra Nevada morning. For the first few miles, the trail was well maintained, the scenery breathtaking. Rayanne and I fell into a comfortable rhythm, old partners with a quiet understanding. Might be a long shot, but keep an eye out for any homeless camps. Rayanne muttered, scanning the undergrowth. We clear those out when we find them, but they keep popping up. We pushed onwards. Then, around midday, something shifted. The air seemed to grow, thicker. Birds stopped singing. Even the usual breeze rusting through the pines died down. A prickle of unease ran down my spine. Rayan looked back at me, a frown creasing her brow. You feel that? she asked. I nodded. Something's off. And then we saw it the first sign we weren't alone. A deer carcass, strung up high on a tree branch. Not the work of any mountain lion I'd ever seen. The bones were stripped clean, the wounds ragged, and some of those teeth marks, those weren't any animal I recognized. Rayanne and I exchanged a grim look. No drifters did this. We drew our weapons, 
proceeding with even more caution now. The silence was unnerving, broken only by the crunch of our boots on the parched earth. We reached a fork in the trail. One arm continued up towards Grizzly Flats. The other, well, it disappeared into a wall of dense foliage. Let's check it out, Rayanne murmured. Might be a hidden camp. She took the lead, slicing through the undergrowth with a machete. I followed close behind, trying to ignore the sinking feeling in my gut. The makeshift tunnel opened onto a small clearing. But it wasn't a camp. It was more like a nest. The clearing was strewn with debris, animal bones mixed with torn bits of clothing and camping gear. In the center, there was a huge mound of earth and branches. Something shifted on top of that mound, and my blood ran cold. It was massive, at least ten feet tall, covered in matted black fur. It was hunched over, its back to us. But as we stumbled into the clearing, the creature turned its head. And that's when I saw its face. It was vaguely human, but twisted. Eyes too small, yellow, and set deep in a skull that jutted at an unnatural angle. The jaw was heavy, filled with rows of jagged teeth, teeth stained with blood. This wasn't a bear, wolf, or any predator found in these mountains. It was something else, something monstrous. It let out a guttural roar, a chilling sound that ripped through the dead still air. I barely had time to raise my rifle before the creature lunged. I fired, more out of instinct than any hope of aiming true. Rayan yelled, opening fire as well. The creature roared again in pain or anger. It was hard to tell. One massive, clawed hand swiped at Rayan, sending her sprawling. But it seemed our shots had an effect. The creature, though still terrifyingly fast, seemed to hesitate. The guns! They work! I shouted, both terrified and relieved, pumping another round into the rifle. We kept firing, forcing the creature back. For a wild moment, I thought we might drive it off. But then, the creature did something unexpected. It turned and ran, not away from us, but back towards the mound in the center of the clearing. It's protecting something, Rayanne gasped. She scrambled to her feet, taking aim. I moved to flank the creature, to distract it. A horrible, piercing cry shot through the air. The earth started to tremble beneath our feet. And then the mound split open. Something smaller, much smaller, rose from it. But it wasn't a cub. It was another creature, a younger version of the larger one. Same black fur, same twisted face, same gleaming yellow eyes. The realization hit me like a cold slap. This wasn't a predator territory. This was family. And we had just attacked them. The larger creature roared again, a mournful, enraged sound that echoed through the bone-silent forest. We gotta get out of here, Rayan yelled. She grabbed my arm, pulling me back the way we'd come. I stumbled after Rayan, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. The creatures were close behind, their roars and the pounding of their massive feet shaking the ground. We ran blindly back through the undergrowth, branches whipping our faces, the nest clearing disappearing behind us. Split up! Rayan shouted over the deafening din. Meet back at the main trail! It was the only logical choice, the only way to increase our chances. I veered off to the left, crashing through the forest. My breath rasped in my lungs, a stitch forming in my side. The creatures were right behind me, their guttural growls edging closer with each passing second. I could almost feel their hot breath on the back of my neck. And then my boot caught on an exposed root, and I went down hard. I rolled, slamming my shoulder into a tree. My rifle flew from my grasp, 
skittering across the damp earth. I struggled to regain my footing, but it was too late. The larger creature burst through the trees with bone-jarring force. It towered over me, a monstrous silhouette against the dim forest light. It raised one massive paw, tipped with foot-long claws, and brought it crashing down. I screamed, throwing up my arms in a futile attempt to protect myself. Then, a gunshot. And another. The creature recoiled with a roar, staggering backward. Rayan came barreling out of the undergrowth, her rifle aimed and steady. Run, Zeke! she yelled, firing again. I didn't need to be told twice. I snatched up my rifle and ran. I heard Rayan shouting, keeping the creature's attention, buying me precious seconds. But she couldn't fight it forever, not alone. Guilt and terror twisted in my gut. I stumbled onto the main trail, scrambling to find my bearings. I sprinted uphill, towards Grizzly Flats, the only direction I could think of. Behind me, the creature's roars faded, replaced by another sound a choked scream, cut short. Rayanne. My heart shattered into a thousand pieces. I ran until I thought my lungs would burst, until my legs turned to jelly. Finally, gasping for breath, I collapsed behind a fallen log, hidden from sight. I forced myself to listen, clutching my rifle like a lifeline. All I heard was the wind whispering through the trees and the frantic pounding of my own heart. When I could move again, I crept back down the trail, following our tracks back to the fork, back to the horrible clearing. I couldn't leave Rayanne couldn't let whatever those creatures would do to her body what they did to the deer. My mind filled with sickening images. The clearing was silent when I reached it. No sign of the creatures, at least not at first glance. But the nest that was undisturbed, the smaller creature nowhere in sight. I steeled myself and approached cautiously. There she was, lying still on the ground. Rayanne, the tough-as-nails woman who'd become like a sister to me. Her eyes were open, staring sightlessly up at the sky. Her body was torn. Massive claw marks raked across her torso. I fell to my knees, a choked sob escaping my throat. Rage and grief consumed me. I vowed, right there and then, to avenge her. No matter what the cost— I would make those creatures pay for what they had done. We had back up on the way, of course. Rayan was too seasoned to venture out without an emergency beacon. But they would be hours away. These creatures, they could be long gone by then. It had to be me. It had to end here. The smaller creature, it was still in that nest mound. Vulnerable. I could feel the hatred simmering within me, a dark, dangerous force I barely recognized. I leveled my rifle, took aim at the trembling mound of earth. This could stop it all right here. But then, a flash of those small, yellow eyes peeking out of the darkness. They looked so scared, so defenseless. Just a baby, in its own monstrous way. And wasn't that how this had started? Us threatening it, invading its home? My finger tightened on the trigger, then eased off. I couldn't do it. I couldn't kill a creature out of revenge, no matter how justified it might feel. The image of Rayanne's ravaged body swam before my eyes. I lowered my rifle, tears streaming down my face. I wouldn't kill the young one but I'd make damn sure those creatures knew this was our territory, not theirs. I took a flare from my pack and lit it. I threw it into the nest. The branches and earth caught fire immediately, sending a plume of smoke billowing into the air. This had been their home. Now it was gone. A warning sign. Then I turned my back on the clearing and ran. The backup team arrived later that day. 
They questioned me, of course, my wild story making their faces tighten with skepticism. But there was the evidence, the clearing, the nest, Rayanne's body. The higher-ups covered it up. Missing hiker, probable animal attack. Easier that way, I understood. Who could believe the truth without sounding like a raving lunatic? I didn't return to Yosemite. Couldn't bear to see the place where Rayan died, knowing those things were still out there. I moved on, taking odd jobs, drifting from place to place. The nightmares followed, vivid and unrelenting. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the creature's roars ringing in my ears, Rayan's lifeless eyes staring at me in accusation. Some nights... I think I see those monstrous shapes lurking in the shadows at the edge of my vision. I hear the rustle of leaves on a windless night, the snap of a twig under an unseen weight. But when I turn, there's nothing there, just the echoes of my own terror. Sometimes I wonder if they're out there, somewhere in the vast wilderness. If they're searching for me, driven by the same hunger for vengeance that burns in my own soul. And sometimes, a small, twisted part of me hopes they are. Because maybe then, I could finally end this nightmare, one way or another. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me on June 12, 1997 while on patrol in Big Bend National Park, Texas. Rugged as held down there, the kind of place that makes a man feel small. I'd been a park ranger for most of my adult life, and I thought I'd seen it all, lost hikers, the odd flash flood, even a tussle with a bear or two. But this, this was something else entirely. It started with a radio call from dispatch. A couple reported a strange sighting on the South Rim Trail, a large, bipedal creature not matching any local wildlife. They'd hightailed it out of there, understandably shaken. Protocol demanded I check it out, despite the absurdity of the report. Bigfoot in Big Bend, huh? I chuckled to myself as I set off towards the trailhead. But somewhere deep down, a sliver of unease crept in. I reached the South Rim Trail in the late afternoon. The sun beat down with a vengeance, baking the desert landscape. I scanned the area, no sign of the panicked couple, no fresh footprints aside from my own. Just the vast, empty beauty of the Chihuahuan Desert stretching out before me. I decided to hike a short way down the trail, just in case. First half mile was uneventful. Then, amidst the rocks and scrub brush, I saw it, a footprint. Massive, at least twice the size of my own boot, with long, clawed toes. A jolt of adrenaline shot through me. That was no bear, and certainly no hoaxer. Whatever made that track was real, and it was big. I followed the trail of prints, my heart pounding a steady rhythm in my chest. They led off the main path, towards a narrow, winding canyon. The sun was dipping lower, casting long, eerie shadows. Logically, I should have radioed for backup, turned around. But a stubborn determination fueled my steps. I had to see what made those tracks, had to prove to myself it was just some oversized critter, not the stuff of campfire legends. The canyon walls closed in around me, the air growing stiflingly still. The only sound was the crunch of my boots on gravel and the distant screech of a hawk. The prince continued deeper in. Then I rounded a bend, and my breath hitched in my throat. There, in a rocky clearing about twenty yards ahead, stood the creature. It had its back to me, hunched over a pile of something. Even from a distance, its sheer size sent a chill down my spine. My first coherent thought was bear, but bigger, much bigger than any grizzly I'd ever encountered. 
Then the creature turned its head, as if sensing my presence. My blood ran cold. This was no bear. Its head was huge, bald, and human. Its face elongated, ending in a protruding snout filled with jagged teeth. And those eyes, small, black, and glinting with a chilling intelligence. In that moment, time seemed to slow down. The creature straightened, rising to its full height. A guttural growl rumbled in its chest, and it stood well over eight feet tall, covered in a coarse, dark brown fur. Every instinct screamed at me to run, but my feet fell rooted to the spot. It was like staring into something primeval, something that defied reason. Then it charged. Not the lumbering gait of a bear, but with a swiftness that defied its size. I snapped out of my daze, fumbling for my rifle. I fired, more out of a desperate need to do something than with any real hope of stopping it. The creature stumbled, letting out a roar that echoed through the canyon. I fired again and again, my shots hitting their mark, yet they seemed to do little more than enrage the beast. It was closing in fast, those wicked claws outstretched. Panic kicked in. I turned and ran. Stumbled down the narrow canyon path. The creature's roars and the pounding of its feet close behind me. The terrain was rough, treacherous, and I nearly twisted my ankle twice. Up ahead, a flicker of hope the canyon opened up slightly, leading to a wider wash. If I could just reach it, maybe I could put some distance between us. A surge of adrenaline gave me a final burst of speed. I stumbled into the wash sucking in ragged breaths. I turned, raising my rifle, expecting to see the creature lunge out of the canyon at any moment. But nothing came. Silence settled thick over the desert. I waited, strained my eyes towards the canyon entrance, my heart lodged in my throat. After what felt like an eternity, I cautiously lowered my rifle. Still nothing. Whatever it was, it had retreated, for now. I inched my way back towards the canyon entrance, gun raised, ready for another attack. But there was no sign of the creature. No blood trail, only those monstrous footprints disappearing back up the canyon. Had it only been wounded? Waiting for me to make a mistake? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. I had to get out of there. I turned and jogged back towards the main trail, breaking into a full sprint the moment the canyon was out of sight. I radioed for backup, my voice hoarse with fear and exertion. The words sounded ridiculous even to my own ears, unknown creature, possible threat, requesting immediate assistance. The sun was setting as I reached my truck. Backup arrived shortly after a whole unit of them, armed to the teeth. They found no carcass, no injured creature. Just my story, and those monstrous footprints. They sent me home on mandatory leave after that. Not surprising, given the unusual nature of my report. Doctors were brought in, poking and prodding, asking if I'd hit my head, if I'd always been one for tall tales. It was humiliating. Made me question my own sanity for a while. But I knew what I saw. They wrote it off as an animal attack, maybe a misidentified bear, they said maybe a rogue wolf. Whatever the official report stated, I could see the doubt in their eyes. I was. Ranger Ellis, the guy who saw Bigfoot. Couldn't go back to work for a time. Not Big Bend, not anywhere. The nightmares were relentless. The creature's inhuman face, the bloodlust in its eyes, the feeling of those monstrous claws inches from my flesh. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, gasping for air. I ended up taking out jobs, manual labor, anything to keep my mind occupied, my hands calloused. Drifted for a while, trying to leave that canyon, that creature behind me. 
One day, about a year later, a package arrived. No return address, just my name scrawled on it. Inside was a newspaper clipping and a note. The clipping was from a local rag up in Wyoming, reporting a string of missing persons around Yellowstone Park. The note was short, written in a shaky hand. They're spreading. It wasn't just you. My blood turned to ice. The Yellowstone disappearances had made national news, but the theories were the usual. Animal attacks, inexperienced hikers, bad luck. But this note, it was confirmation that I was right all along. Those creatures weren't isolated, and the official cover-ups were only going to help them thrive. And in that moment, something shifted inside me. The fear and helplessness were still there, but they were outweighed by a burning anger. These creatures had preyed on innocent people, hikers, campers, maybe others who, like me, saw a glimpse of the truth and were dismissed as crazy. Those creatures were a danger, a cancer on the wild places that were supposed to be safe. They needed to be stopped. I wouldn't let others suffer the same way I had. I cashed out my meager savings, bought a heavy-duty truck, outfitted it for long-term off-grid living. The plan was simple, as insane as it sounded. I'd follow the disappearances, track those things down, document them, gather proof. I couldn't kill them, but maybe I could expose them, warn people. I had the skills, the woodsman's intuition. I'd spent years surviving in the backcountry. Now I'd become the hunter instead of the hunted. It was a desperate, possibly suicidal plan. But sitting back, doing nothing while people vanished into the wilderness, I couldn't live with that choice, not anymore. The next day, I loaded up my truck and hit the road, heading north. Wyoming was the first stop, but I knew it wouldn't be the last. My quest, if you could call it that, had begun. And it wouldn't end until the truth was out there, or I was dead. One or the other. My journey took me to the remote corners of America. I followed rumors and reports of strange sightings, venturing into places most people avoided, deep forests, desolate swamps, rugged mountain ranges. Locals often looked at me like I was mad. Some had their own stories, whispered around campfires, about things lurking in the shadows. But most dismissed me as another Bigfoot nut, a conspiracy theorist chasing shadows. I kept meticulous records, every footprint, every torn-up campsite, every eerie howl in the night. My truck became a mobile command center, crammed with maps, field guides, and enough firepower to start a small war. With each new clue, a pattern started to emerge. The attacks were sporadic but escalating. These creatures were intelligent, adaptable. They were learning. I came face to face with them three more times over the years. Once in the dense redwood forests of Northern California, once in the alligator-infested swamps of the Everglades, and lastly, in an abandoned mining town deep in the Alaskan wilderness. Each encounter was harrowing, pushing me to the breaking point. Each time, I barely escaped with my life. News of my crusade leaked out into certain circles. I became a sort of shadowy figure, part boogeyman, part folk hero, amongst those who believed there were more things out there than met the eye. A few even contacted me with their own stories, tips, sometimes pleas for help. One such message was from a woman named Sarah, her voice trembling on the voicemail she left. Sarah's brother, an avid hiker named Ethan, went missing in the Olympic National Forest in Washington State. The official search was called off, but Sarah refused to give up hope. She'd heard whispers about my work, my reputation. Begged me to come, to try where others had failed. Something in her desperation sparked a flicker of recognition. 
The Olympic Peninsula, dense old-growth forests, remote trails. It fit the pattern. And if there was a chance Ethan was still alive, a chance those creatures held him. I couldn't say no. I arrived in the small town near the park a few days later. Sarah was waiting, a haunted look in her eyes. She clung to my presence as if I were a lifeline. We went through Ethan's last known movements, poring over maps and trip itineraries. It was a shot in the dark, I warned her, but she nodded grimly, the fire of determination burning bright. I respected that in her, recognized a mirroring of my own obsession. I ventured into the heart of the Olympics alone. It was slow, methodical work, days of scouring the forest floor, studying tracks, marking potential territory on my map. Those woods felt different, even to me. An oppressive silence hung over everything, a sense of being watched. It put me constantly on edge. One evening, as the sun began to dip below the canopy, I saw them again. Not just one this time. Three figures, hulking in the twilight. One was the massive creature I'd seen all those years ago in Big Bend, its size somehow even more terrifying now. The other two were smaller, but still monstrous. My heart hammered against my ribs, but the fear was laced with a white-hot rage. Something had changed. These creatures, they were bolder. I watched from my vantage point as they stalked a family of deer, their movements coordinated and chillingly efficient. Unlike those first desperate attacks in the desert and the swamps, this was a practice hunt. They were getting better, stronger. Humanity, we were underestimating the threat. My name's Kate Warren, and this happened to me on October 17, 2014, deep in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Been working these woods my whole life, just like my pappy before me. Knew them trails like the back of my hand, thought nothing could surprise me anymore. Guess I was wrong about that. It began with a missing persons case. Two college kids on a weekend camping trip gone off the grid. Folks get lost up in these mountains all the time, but something about this felt different. No sign of their gear, no sign of them at all, not a trace. Now, that set off alarm bells. Started wondering if maybe some drifter or escaped calm was hiding out, preying on the unwary. I was tasked with leading the search party up into the higher elevations where they'd last been seen. We went in packing heavy, rifles, emergency supplies, the works. Wasn't expecting to find some boy scouts out for a casual hike. The woods felt heavy, air thick even for autumn. Team was on edge too, a sense that we weren't alone out there. We made camp that night in a narrow valley intending to continue the search at daybreak. After dinner, I decided to take a perimeter walk old ranger habits die hard. Straight a little ways from the firelight, just scanning the tree line. That's when I heard it, a rustling sound, then a low, guttural growl. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Wasn't no animal I recognized. Back at camp, everyone was asleep. It was probably nothing, I told myself. Probably some half-starved coyote. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I spent the rest of the night listening to the symphony of crickets punctuated by the occasional snap of a branch, the hoot of an owl, and something else. Something that sounded far too big, far too close for comfort. The next morning broke cold and clear. We began our search again, spreading out to cover more ground. Hours passed without a sign. I found myself gravitating to the areas most overgrown, the tangled thickets of rhododendron. 
Something told me these kids hadn't wandered far from where they began. By midday, two of my team were getting jumpy. They'd heard those noises too, swore they saw shadows just out of sight. It wasn't their imaginations. Then, just ahead, the bushes trembled, and a massive shape burst forth. For a moment, my mind went blank. This thing was a nightmare made flesh. Standing at least nine feet tall, caked in mud and who knows what else. It was impossibly strong-looking, muscles rippling beneath a coat of thick black fur. The head was hard to describe. Small and hunched forward, with a flat, protruding snout and tiny black eyes full of predatory cunning. It roared, bearing rows of vicious teeth, and that's when the smell hit me, like rotting meat and something altogether fouler. I shouted for the team to fall back, raising my rifle and firing off warning shots. The thing flinched, then charged forward, its speed terrifying. We fell back in disarray, firing as we went. The creature barreled forward heedless of the gunfire. It lunged at a young ranger named Beth, its clawed hand the size of a bear trap raking across her torso. She screamed, then crumpled to the ground. Chaos then. Shots rang out, and the creature let out an enraged roar. I saw it grab another ranger, Tom, and toss him aside like a broken doll. Then, as suddenly as it materialized, it was gone, vanishing into the undergrowth with impossible agility. I sprinted to Beth, the world blurring around me. Blood soaked through my hands as I tried to stop the bleeding. Her eyes stared lifelessly up at the sky. Tom's fate wasn't much better. He lay sprawled against a tree, legs mangled, neck twisted at an unnatural angle. Only one other ranger, Jensen, had escaped and scathed, his face pale with shock. The three of us were all that remained of the search party, left staring at the mangled remains of our comrades. The creature had moved off. It could be anywhere, watching us, stalking, waiting. We radioed for backup, voices trembling. But who the hell would believe us? Ranger deaths, sure. Animal attack, maybe. But a hulking, unidentified monster that shrugged off gunfire? Backup came, of course. Arm support, even a chopper circling overhead. What they didn't find was the creature. They did find the bodies, the campsite ransacked, and the remnants of an animal carcass nearby, torn to bloody ribbons. They also found footprints, huge prints unlike anything in the official wildlife guides. The official report went with mountain lion attack. Easier to swallow, I suppose. Easier to avoid the media frenzy and uncomfortable questions about what else lurked out there. It didn't bring back Beth or Tom, didn't change the fact that whatever we encountered that day wasn't natural, wasn't simply part of the ecosystem. They told me to take leave. Said I was suffering shock trauma. Maybe they were right. But I couldn't sit still couldn't forget the creature's malevolent glare, the sickening reek of its fur. Couldn't forget Beth's last, terrified scream. Left the mountains for a while, drifted, did odd jobs. But the nightmares followed me. Now I'm back. Not working as a ranger anymore, at least not officially. I patrol different wilderness areas now, the sprawling forests and swamplands, chasing rumors of hunters disappearing, hikers vanishing. I leave notes, warnings for those brave enough or foolish enough to venture into the deepest parts of the backcountry. Beware. Predator at large. Someone has to do it. Someone has to stand between the innocent and the things that lurk in the shadows. It's a lonely existence, a thankless one. And one of these days, that creature or one of its kin will find me again. I know that except that. It's an ugly world sometimes. 
but even the ugliest truths need to be brought to light. My pursuit became an obsession. I'd spot a story in the local papers, an unexplained disappearance in some remote corner of the country, and I'd be on the road. Each new location offered a twisted puzzle, tracks defying identification, half-eaten animal carcasses, the lingering whispers of terrified witnesses. I'd camp alone in the woods for weeks, my senses always on high alert, waiting for the slightest hint of movement, the faintest whiff of that putrid musk in the air. I started keeping even more detailed records. I meticulously cataloged each encounter, each footprint or shredded campsite. Cross-referenced the sightings, mapped likely hunting ranges. Those creatures weren't random. There were patterns emerging, a preference for dense, old-growth forests, a tendency to stick to the fringes of civilization. They were intelligent, adaptable, and they were becoming bolder. The obsession came at a cost. Relationships unraveled. Anyone who stuck around long enough saw the haunted look in my eyes, the way I'd jump at every creaking floorboard. My savings dwindled, replaced by a collection of worn trail boots, battered binoculars, and a shotgun that rarely left my side. Didn't matter. This was bigger than any one person. One trail led north, way up into the isolated forests along the U.S.-Canadian border. There, I befriended a wiry, weathered old trapper named Hank, one of the few who believed my outlandish tales. Hank swore he'd seen something monstrous up on the ridgeline above his cabin, something that snatched one of his traps clean off its chain, a trap that could hold a grizzly. We spent a week up in those woods, laying out extra traps, cameras, waiting for the creature to return. It did on the fourth night. But it wasn't alone. I woke to Hank's panicked shouts and gunfire ripping through the darkness. I scrambled out of my tent, sleep-fogged and disoriented. The clearing in front of Hank's cabin was a scene of utter chaos. Hank was slumped against the porch, already gone, his chest ripped open by monstrous claws. One of the creatures, the same massive brood I remembered from the Smokies, stood over his body, blood dripping from its fangs. It turned, pinning me in the glare of those beady, malevolent eyes. A younger, smaller creature flanked it, for dappled with Hank's fresh blood. Rage and grief ignited within me. This was personal now. I raised my rifle and fired, a desperate act of defiance. The bigger creature snarled, swiping a massive paw in my direction. I dove for cover, rolling behind the remains of Hank's woodshed. Splinters flew as the creature demolished the structure with brute force. I was pinned down, heart pounding like a war drum. Another gunshot. The younger creature cried out in pain. I risked a glance and saw it limping away into the trees, a streak of red trailing behind. One down, at least. But the larger one, the real threat, was still focused on ripping me to shreds. Hope flared when a vehicle roared up the dirt path leading to the cabin. Two figures, strangers, leaped out, armed to the teeth. They'd heard the commotion, they shouted, We're here to help. For a fleeting second, I believed salvation had arrived. But something was wrong. Their movements were jerky, awkward, their expressions fixed. Then I noticed the way their eyes gleamed in the moonlight, those same small, black, unnaturally intelligent eyes. More of those creatures, wearing human skin. I opened my mouth to shout a warning, but it was too late. The two newcomers turned their guns on me. The first shot slammed into my shoulder, sending me sprawling. Another tore through the flimsy cover of the woodshed. The hulking creature was closing in, sensing my vulnerability, relishing the kill. This was it. After all those years, all those solitary miles, it would end not with a hero's stand, 
but a desperate demise in this remote, blood-soaked clearing. Then, as if called from a nightmare, a new sound split the air. It started as a low rumble, rising to a deep, ground-shaking roar. Something dark and impossibly huge crashed through the tree lean. The creatures, including the one closing in on me, froze, confusion replacing their bloodlust. From the shadows emerged a bear, but a bear like none I'd ever seen. Twice the size of a grizzly, with a broad chest and claws the length of machetes. Its eyes blazed with not just animal fury, but a chilling, primal intelligence. It charged the creatures with a roar that rattled my bones. The bear was a blur of fur and teeth. One of the disguised creatures barely had time to raise its gun before the bear ripped it apart in a spray of blood. The other fled, scrambling for its truck. The monstrous creature that had stalked me, the killer of Beth and Tom, hesitated, then turned to face this new threat. What followed was a clash of titans. The bear and the creature tore into each other, the clearing shaking with the force of their blows. I scrambled to my feet, my wounded shoulder screaming in protest. The newcomer's truck sputtered to life, its tires spinning as it disappeared down the dirt track. I fumbled with my rifle, but the fight raged beyond my ability to intervene. This was their battle now fought for reasons I couldn't fathom. And as quickly as it started, it was over. The creature, outmatched in sheer size and power, lay crumpled on the blood-soaked ground. The giant bear stood above it, breathing heavily, a fresh gash across its flank. It turned its massive head and looked directly at me. And in that moment, I felt a surge of understanding. This bear, this and possibly large protector of the wilds. It was connected to those creatures in a way I didn't grasp. Part of some ancient balance I was only beginning to glimpse. The bear lumbered away, disappearing back into the trees with the same eerie silence it had appeared from. I stood there shaking, the world tilted on its axis. As dawn spilled over the clearing, I saw the damage in stark light. Hank's lifeless form, the monstrous corpses, still unsettlingly human-like, the remnants of a battle that defied understanding, the aftermath is a blur. I made the call, gave the report filled with words like, bear attack, unknown assailants, more lies to cover up a truth too dangerous to tell. They buried Hank and cleaned up the clearing, sanitizing the scene into something explainable, something easy to forget. I continued to wander, following the trail of blood and whispers. That battle up north changed me. Now I'm not just a hunter, but a witness to a hidden world, a world where nature itself fights back against the crawling darkness. The quest isn't about killing those creatures anymore, it's about learning about understanding the forces at play out there. And maybe, just maybe, finding a way for all of us, human and other, to survive together. My name is Malachi Brooks, and this happened to me on July 22, 2009 been a park ranger all my life, just like my granddad before me. We take pride in protecting Yellowstone National Park, those wide-open spaces, the geysers, the wildlife. Folks assume it's all bison and bear encounters, lost hikers, that sort of thing. But what most don't know, what they never put in the tourist brochures, is that there are other things lurking out there. Things that make a grizzly bear look as harmless as a chipmunk. I found that out firsthand on a sweltering day a few summers back. They sent me out with a rookie named Kira, fresh out of the academy and eager to prove herself. Mission was routine. Check out reports of illegal poachers near the park's eastern boundary. We set out before dawn, 
thinking we could hike a ways in, keep watch, and be back by nightfall. The air was thick up in those woods, buzzing with mosquitoes and the smell of wet pine needles. Something about that area always set my teeth on edge. Even the birds seemed quieter up there. About a half mile in, we found the carcass, an elk, half devoured, the kill still fresh. Then we saw the prince. Too big for a wolf, too deep for a mountain lion. A chill ran down my spine. This wasn't a poacher we were dealing with, not the usual kind, anyway. Kira, she was still all by the book, bless her heart. Wanted to radio for backup, set up a perimeter. I knew that wouldn't be enough. Whatever made those tracks was big, strong, and smart enough to avoid our standard traps. If we were going to stop it, we had to go in deeper. We tracked the prints. They led us into a tangled ravine, a mess of fallen trees and overgrown vines. That's when the stench hit us, like rotten meat left out in the sun for weeks. My instincts were screaming at me to get the hell out of there, but Kira, she was determined, said we had a duty to protect the park, to stop this creature, whatever it was. As we pushed further in, the ravine suddenly opened up into a clearing, and standing there, in the center, was the source of that awful smell. I'd seen some things in my years on the job, things that would send shivers down most folks' spines. But nothing, nothing prepared me for the sight of that creature. It was, it was like a man, if a man was twisted all wrong by some cruel design. Standing close to ten feet tall, covered in matted gray fur, with a hunched back that made its arms drag along the ground. Its head, that's the image that still haunts me at night. Long and narrow, with a muzzle that jutted out like a wolf's, only filled with far, far too many teeth. And the eyes, small, black beads, shining with a terrifying hunger and something else, a chilling intelligence. It turned its head towards us, sniffing the air, and let out a low, menacing growl. Kiara gasped, stumbling backwards. She raised her rifle, but her hands were shaking so badly I don't think she could have hit the side of a barn. The creature tensed, muscles rippling beneath its mangy fur. Had to think fast. I knew we couldn't outrun that thing, couldn't outshoot it. Go! I yelled at Kira. Run! Don't look back! I didn't need to tell her twice. She sprinted back towards the ravine, the dry leaves crunching beneath her boots. Smart girl knew she didn't stand a chance in a one-on-one -on -one against that monster. But now it had me in its sights. The creature lumbered forward, moving with surprising speed for its size. I fired my rifle, more to distract it, by myself a few precious seconds, than with any hope of stopping it. The bullet smacked into its thick hide. It flinched but kept coming, a look of pure fury contorting its monstrous features. I flung the useless rifle aside and reached for my knife. Not the best weapon against a creature like that, but it was all I had. The thing closed in, the stink of its breath washing over me. I braced myself, waiting for the impact, the crushing blow, the shark, searing pain. That's when a blur of brown fur shot past, slamming into the creature. I whirled around, scarcely believing my eyes. A wolf, a huge damn wolf, had leapt out of nowhere and latched itself onto the creature's leg. The wolf snapped and snarled, tearing at the creature's flesh. The creature roared in rage, swiping at the wolf with one of its massive claws. The wolf yelped and went rolling, but it had bought me a split second. Using that brief distraction, I scrambled backwards, searching frantically for some kind of advantage. A fallen tree lay nearby, its branches thick and sturdy. Desperation fueled me. Grabbing a hold of one of those branches, I hefted it with a grunt. 
The creature was back on its feet, flinging the injured wolf aside like a rag doll. The poor thing lay whimpering in the dirt. Now the creature focused its attention back on me. It rushed me. I braced myself, and using all my strength, I swung the heavy branch like a baseball bat. It connected with the side of the creature's head, sending it stumbling. It let out a bellow that shook the ground, and spun toward me, eyes blazing. I didn't wait around for round two. I turned and ran. My legs pumped like pistons, fueled by a cocktail of adrenaline and terror. I didn't know where I was going, just away from that monster, away from the clearing. Behind me, I heard crashing and snarling. The creature was in pursuit. Each cracking twig, each gasping breath, felt like it'd be my last. The terrain wasn't doing me any favors. Roots twisted at my ankles, low-hanging branches clawed at my face. I stumbled and fell, sprawling onto the damp forest floor. A wave of despair crashed over me. This is where it ends, I thought. This is how the grizzled ranger finally goes, torn to shreds in this forgotten corner of the park. Then, echoing across the ravine, came a howl. Not the creature's, but a wolf's, a defiant cry. Suddenly, more howls joined in, a whole chorus rising from the surrounding woods. The pounding of paws grew louder, and I realized, in a surge of hope, that the injured wolf wasn't alone. A pack had answered its call. Scrambling to my feet, I pushed deeper into the trees. The crashing behind me sounded different, chaotic. Could the wolves actually be slowing the creature down? I didn't dare look back just kept running, branches whipping my face. The sounds of pursuit began to fade. Maybe I'd gotten lucky. Maybe the pack had actually managed to drive that thing off, or at least distract it long enough for me to escape. But even that hope came with a grim realization. The wolves were out there now, agitated, on the hunt. The danger wasn't over, just different. Finally, I burst from the undergrowth, back onto familiar ground. Up ahead was the trailhead, a tantalizing strip of sunshine breaking through the heavy forest canopy. I sprinted across the clearing, not stopping until I skidded into the gravel of the parking lot. Then, and only then, I collapsed, gasping for breath. My body throbbed in protest. My clothes were a shredded mess, spattered with blood, some of it mine, some of it, not. I stayed there on the ground for I don't know how long. The adrenaline began to fade, replaced by a bone-deep exhaustion. I should have radioed in immediately, but part of me, part of me was dreading it, dreading trying to explain what I had encountered. Eventually, I forced myself to stumble to my feet. My truck sat patiently where I'd left it, the normalcy of it jarring after what I'd just been through. I managed to patch through a call to dispatch, voice shaking. Told them my location, that there was an incident, a creature attack, multiple casualties. I left out the details, knowing they wouldn't believe me, not without proof. They sent in a whole team, armed to the teeth. They found Kira shaken but unhurt, not too far from where I'd last seen her. She was babbling about a monster, a nightmare vision of teeth and fur. I put it down to shock, knew she would never get the real image of that creature out of her head. They found the carcass of a wolf, too, torn apart savagely. And further up in the ravine, the clearing, there were traces of a struggle, blood, massive footprints that abruptly disappeared into the undergrowth. But no bodies, no sign of the creature I'd fought with. The higher-ups brushed the whole thing off as a wolf attack, maybe a rabid one. Kira quit not long after. Can't say I blame her. I kept my mouth shut. Took the official reprimand, the sideways glances when folks thought I wasn't listening. 
Ranger Brooks sees things, they whispered. Better suited to telling campfire stories than patrolling a national park. Let them think that. Let them live in their comfortable world where the maps still have blank spaces, where the worst monsters are the human kind. I kept patrolling Yellowstone, kept venturing into those deep, shadowy places. Never saw that creature again, not exactly. But I started noticing things out of the corner of my eye, a flash of movement on a ridgeline, an unnatural silence falling over a section of the woods, a strange musky scent on the wind. I began leaving offerings, scraps of food, a broken arrow, in spots where I sensed something lurking, a peace offering of sorts. Some call me crazy, maybe they're right. Maybe I snapped up there in that ravine, seeing things that weren't real. But I know what I saw. And I also know there are forces we barely understand at work in our wilderness. The wolves, they seem to understand it too. We got a sort of unspoken truce, me and them. We both know there are threats out there bigger than poachers, bigger than wayward bison. They watch over Yellowstone in their way, and I watch over it in mine. Nights are the worst. That's when the nightmares creep in, vivid replays of the clearing, the creature's fetid breath, Kira's terrified face. And I wonder, what did that creature want? Why was it there? Was it alone, or are there more of them out there, biding their time? I don't know, and in a way, maybe it's better that way. All I can do is my job, keep the balance as best I can. See, the folks visiting the geysers, snapping photos of the elk herds, they don't know the half of it. They see the beauty of Yellowstone, and that's a good thing. But beneath the surface, there's a wilder, more ancient heart beating. There's a hidden world right next to ours, full of things that defy easy names and explanations. And sometimes, sometimes those worlds collide. My name is Harlan Yates, and this happened to me on October 23, 2012. Been with the National Park Service since I could walk, a ranger like my old man and his old man before him. The Appalachian Trail is my patch. These mountains are in my blood. Thought I'd seen it all out here. Bear encounters, meth head camps, the occasional lost hiker gone bush crazy. But nothing, and I mean nothing, could prepare me for that fall, the season when something stalked those woods. Started with a string of disappearances. Hikers mainly, a few solo campers. Folks just vanishing, leaving behind half-eaten meals, abandoned tents. No bodies, no signs of a struggle, just an absence, like they'd walked off the face of the earth. Now, these mountains are vast, they swallow people up sometimes. Folks get disoriented, accidents happen. But this felt different. There was a pattern to the disappearances all in the same rugged stretch north of the Smokies, all around the full moon. They sent me to investigate. Said it was probably a rogue bear, or maybe some drifter preying on the unwary. But I had a gnawing feeling in my gut that this was something worse, something unnatural. I packed heavy, not just standard ranger gear, but an old hunting rifle passed down from my granddad, a few silver rounds tucked in my pocket. Crazy, maybe, but sometimes old superstitions stick for a reason. Up in those woods, the air felt heavy, even in the crisp October sunlight. Animals were skittish, or eerily absent. That constant bird song you expect in the Appalachians? Gone. Just silence, and the endless rustle of leaves under my boots made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I stuck to the main trail, but kept glancing into the dense undergrowth, half expecting to see eyes shining back at me. 
night fell earlier in those deep hollows. I made camp in a small clearing, built a fire to ward off the damp chill and the growing sense of unease. No use pretending to sleep. I sat with my back to a sturdy oak, rifle across my lap, and listened to the forest creak and groan around me. Every snap of a branch made me jump. Around midnight I saw it. Just a flicker at first, a hulking shape moving through the trees on the far side of the clearing. Moonlight glinted off something, an eye, too big to belong to any animal I knew. Then, a low growl rumbled through the night, deep and menacing. I raised my rifle, heart pounding in my throat. It stepped out into the clearing. Lord help me, I'll never unsee that sight. It was like a bear, if a bear walked on its hind legs and had been twisted all wrong. Easily eight feet tall, covered in coarse black fur that rippled in the moonlight like it was alive. Its head was wolfish, but elongated, filled with rows of gleaming teeth. And those eyes, small, yellow, and blazing with hunger. Hunger, and something else, a dark intelligence that made my skin crawl. The creature didn't charge right away. It just stood there, watching me. Judging me. My finger tightened on the trigger, but there was a primal part of me that understood. This wasn't just a predator. It was sizing me up, deciding if I was a threat or a meal. Then it cocked its head to the side, as if listening to something I couldn't hear. And that's when the screaming started. It tore through the night, a human scream, a woman's voice, filled with terror. It came from further up the trail, the direction I was headed. Something shifted in the creature's stance. It seemed to lose interest in me, its massive form turning away, focused on this new sound. Then it was gone, disappearing into the shadows with unnatural speed. I sat for a moment, catching my breath, trying to process what had just happened. Then duty, or maybe sheer foolishness, kicked in. Leaving the safety of the clearing, I crept along the trail, following the direction of the screams. My hands were slick with sweat on the stock of the rifle. The screams faded, then started again, weaker, choked with sobs. I rounded a bend in the trail, and my breath hitched in my throat. A lone figure huddled by a fallen tree, maybe a hundred yards ahead. Even in the dim moonlight, I knew it was a woman. I saw the glint of metal too, a knife, raised defensively before her. She hadn't seen me yet. And then she wasn't alone. The creature emerged from the trees directly behind her, utterly silent. One massive clawed hand reached out, a killing blow in the making. I didn't think, just reacted. I raised the rifle and fired, aiming for its hulking torso. The shot echoed loudly, breaking the tense stillness. The creature roared, a deafening sound, and whirled around to face me. The woman scrambled to her feet, her eyes wide with terror as she spotted me and the monstrous thing between us. Those malevolent eyes narrowed, fixed on me. It lowered its body, preparing to charge. I had maybe one, two shots left. And then a blur of motion slammed into the creature from the side, sending them both tumbling to the ground. A dog, a massive wolfhound, had leapt out of the darkness, its jaws locked onto the creature's shoulder. The woman screamed again, but this time with a flicker of desperate hope. The monstrous creature thrashed and snarled, trying to throw the wolfhound off. But the dog clung on, its teeth sunk deep into the creature's flesh. Momentarily distracted, it hadn't seen the woman scrambling for my spare rifle on the ground. I saw her pick it up, fumbling with the unfamiliar weapon. Shoot! I yelled. Shoot it in the head! She turned towards us, moonlight glinting off the barrel of the rifle. Her hands were shaking, 
and I swear she had tears streaming down her face. But then her expression hardened, a flicker of something like defiance igniting in her eyes. She raised the rifle and fired a shot. The creature howled in pain, rearing back. The wolfhound seized the opportunity, lunging for its throat. The two beasts rolled across the trail, a whirlwind of fur and teeth and claws. I used the chaos to reload, my hands moving on autopilot as my mind reeled. But another shot wasn't necessary. With a final guttural snarl, the creature went limp. The wolfhound, panting, spattered with blood, held its ground for a second longer, then slumped to the earth beside its fallen foe. The woman just stood there, trembling, the discarded rifle at her feet. Silence fell again, broken only by our rasping breaths. Then, cautiously, I moved forward. The creature lay sprawled on the ground. One eye, clouded and lifeless, stared up at the glittering stars. I inched closer for a better look. The wolfhound whined, limping towards me. I knelt beside it, stroking its matted fur, and saw the blood soaking its flank. Stay, I whispered, not sure if it would obey, but it laid down, breathing heavily. The woman, ghost pale, finally moved as well. She walked unsteadily towards the creature, an odd mix of revulsion and morbid curiosity on her face. Up close, it was even more grotesque. For grew in patches, revealing leathery gray skin tight against bone. Its fingers, if you could call them that, were long, tipped in curved black claws. The teeth, far too many teeth, were a jumbled mess, some jagged and sharp, others flat like molars. It shouldn't have existed, not in any world I understood. What the hell? The woman finally choked out, echoing my own thoughts. Don't know, I admitted, my voice rough. But this might explain some things. We stared at the creature. The disappearances, the eerie animal behavior, the feeling of being watched in the woods, it clicked into horrifying focus. We weren't the only ones who knew something was hunting these mountains. When the sun finally peeked over the ridge line, exhaustion crashed over me. We managed to bandage the wolfhound's wound as best we could. Miraculously, it seemed strong enough to walk, limping yet determined by my side. The woman, who introduced herself as Amelia, carried the rifles. We left the creature where it lay. No sense trying to haul that thing back to civilization. It would rot, or become a feast for scavengers, leaving no trace, no proof of the nightmare. The hike back was mostly a blur. Amelia, as it turned out, was an experienced through hiker, and her familiarity with the trail got us to a ranger station well before nightfall. We reported a rogue bear attack, a vicious one. Showed off the wolfhound's injuries, a half-truth as cover for the whole insane story. They send a chopper for the dog, bless them. Turns out that wolfhound, a brave beast named Thor, was a legend among long-distance hikers, famous for wandering the trail alone and fending off countless threats, two-legged and four. Heard tell he recovered just fine, though they never figured out where he'd come from or who, if anyone, he belonged to. Amelia was hailed as a survivor, interviewed on the news. I kept my mouth shut, slipped back into my ranger routine, patrolling those same trails but never alone anymore. Thor, when he got strong again, always seemed to wander close by when I was on duty, a silent, shaggy guardian. I led him. It brought a strange kind of comfort. They never found any more bodies in those woods, never found another trace of the creature. The disappearances stopped just like that. Folks wrote it off as a bear gone bad, finally killed or moved on. Me? I know better. But the higher-ups think I got too close to the bear attack, suffered a bit of trauma. 
Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm imagining things, seeing danger lurking behind every tree. Then again, these mountains, they hold secrets older than us. Some secrets are meant to stay that way. Sometimes, though, on those long nights out on patrol, I hear a rustle in the underbrush, a low growl quickly fading away. Or I'll see a flash of yellow eyes from deep in the tree line. And I wonder, is it gone for good? Or is it still out there, biding its time, studying me the same way it did that first night? Has it learned? Am I no longer just a ranger, but now marked as prey? See, the folks who say there's nothing dangerous in the woods, nothing scarier than a hungry bear, they've never looked into eyes that burned with something far more sinister than animal instinct. They don't know, but that makes them the lucky ones. I carry that knowledge with me, the weight of that unseen gaze. And every time I step onto a trail, part of me wonders, this time, will my patrol be my last? My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me on July 4, 2006. I've been a ranger with the Forest Service for longer than I care to admit. Mostly, the job's about keeping an eye on trail conditions, busting illegal campsites, the kind of stuff folks might take for granted. But out here in the remote stretches of the Idaho backcountry, well, you see things that don't always end up in the official reports. That summer had been a scorcher, the woods tinder dry and crackling underfoot. I was heading alone to check out smoke reports by an old fire lookout tower near the Selkirk Mountains. Routine, usually. But the fire season, it was turning nasty, and a bad blaze could tear through those forests with terrifying speed. Got to the trailhead just before noon. Sun beat down mercilessly, making the air shimmer. The usual crowd of holiday hikers was absent, smart of them, considering the heat and the fire risk. Seemed I had the whole mountain to myself. Reckon that was a mixed blessing. If something did go wrong, I was a long way from help. Still, duty called. I filled my water canteen, shouldered my pack, and headed up the trail. Didn't take long for that sense of unease to prickle the back of my neck. Wasn't just the heat making me edgy. Something about the forest felt wrong. The wildlife was missing. No birdsong, no squirrels rustling in the underbrush, even the buzz of insects faded out the deeper I went. Just an oppressive kind of silence. By late afternoon, I was closing in on the lookout tower. The smoke had been a false alarm, likely another hiker being careless with their campfire. But that didn't explain the growing dread coiling in my gut. Then I found the signs. First, there were the prints. Massive things, way too big for a bear, sunk into the dried mud by a stream. The shape was all wrong, claws longer than my hand, a heel pad that didn't belong to any animal I recognized. Whatever made those prints, it walked on two legs. Then the trees. Thick gashes raked through the bark, higher up than even a grizzly could reach standing on its hind legs. And a few thick strands of coarse, dark hair snagged in one of the gashes. Sent a shiver down my spine. The lookout tower was just ahead. It was an old wooden thing perched on a rocky outcropping, offering panoramic views of the surrounding peaks. A good place to spot fires, also a good place to get cornered. I crept closer, rifle at the ready. If a bear had gone rogue, if some poacher was up here causing trouble, this was where I'd find them. But what I found chilled me far more than any man or ordinary beast. The tower's base was splattered with something dark and sticky. Blood. A ripped piece of bloody denim lay by the wooden ladder. The scent of copper, 
and something far fouler hung heavy in the air. And in the dirt around the tower were those massive footprints again. Slowly, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs, I circled the tower. The blood led up the ladder, towards the observation deck. I didn't want to see what was up there, didn't want to confirm what my gut already screamed at me. But sometimes with this job, there's no walking away from the ugly truth. I took the ladder rungs one at a time, hand tight on the splintery wood, rifle ready to bring up. The breeze had picked up, carrying a fresh wave of that foul, rotten meat stink with it. I reached the top and steeled myself to look. My first thought was there had been a struggle right out of some nightmare. Blood smeared the wooden planks. Bits of what looked like torn clothing clung to rusty nails. But there was no body. Just an overturned camping chair, a scattered map, and the remnants of what must have been a hastily abandoned meal. Then I saw it, crouched in the far corner of the deck. At first I mistook it for a shadow, just a trick of the fading afternoon light. But then it moved. It was like no creature I'd ever encountered. Humanoid, in a grotesque kind of way, but far too tall, close to seven feet even in its hunched posture. Lean and muscled, covered in patchy black fur, with a narrow elongated skull that sloped into a wolfish snout. But those eyes, they were worst of all. Small, yellow, and burning with a hunger that was primal yet cunning. It let out a low, menacing growl, bearing needle-like teeth. Then, without warning, it sprang. The thing was on me in a heartbeat, a blur of claws and teeth. I fired off a wild shot, more of a reflexive jerk than anything aimed. The bullet went wide, tearing into the rotting wood of the railing. Snarling, the creature batted my rifle aside with a strength that sent the weapon flying from my grip. I stumbled backwards, tripping over the discarded camping chair. It lunged at me, claws outstretched to rip. Pure instinct took over. I flung myself over the railing. It was a desperate, stupid move, a good fifteen-foot drop to the rocky ground below. But it was also, I realized too late, exactly what the creature wanted. I hit the earth with bone-jarring force. The impact knocked the wind out of me, stars bursting in my vision. Pain shot up my leg definitely sprained, maybe worse. The creature landed nimbly beside me, a dark shadow against the fading sunlight. It stalked towards me, a predator savoring its cornered prey. There was nowhere to run, no way to defend myself. This was it. I was going to die up here, torn to pieces by this, this monster from a nightmare. Adrenaline and raw terror gave me one last surge of desperate energy. Ignoring the screaming pain in my leg, I half-crawled, half-rolled towards the base of the tower, fumbling for the discarded rifle. The creature closed in fast. Too fast. Saliva dripped from those horrific jaws. I managed to grab hold of the rifle stock, yanked it close, just as the thing lunged. My vision blurred, my arms shook with the effort of bracing myself, and the world exploded in noise. I'd fired blind, not expecting to hit anything. But the beast roared in sudden agony. My shot had caught it in the shoulder, ripping through flesh and muscle. Dark blood sprayed across the rocks. Stumbling back, it glared at me with pure malevolence but there was a wary glint in those wicked eyes now, too. Another shot would surely finish it off. But fumbling with my busted leg, I knew I couldn't reload in time. The creature wasn't sticking around. It turned and bounded off into the trees, disappearing with unsettling grace despite its injury. I watched it go, chest heaving, heart pounding in my throat. It had gotten away, but for the moment, I was alive. Dragging myself back to the tower, I fumbled for my radio, voice shaking as I called for backup. 
They didn't believe me, the ranger who claimed to have seen Bigfoot, who somehow managed to shoot himself in the leg in the process. But they came anyway, a whole team of them, bristling with weapons and disbelief. They found no body at the tower, not human or otherwise. They found the blood, the ripped clothing, the signs of a struggle, and my rifle with one shell casing missing. The official verdict was a bear attack, victim unknown. I went on medical leave for my injured leg. Never did get credit for scaring off that bear, whatever it was. Folks whisper, up there in the high country, about the tower with bloodstains they couldn't wash clean, about the ranger who went a little crazy after what he saw. Maybe they're right. Sometimes, at night, I can still feel the burn of those yellow eyes on me, can still smell the putrid stench of the creature's breath on my skin. The worst part is, I know it's out there. Injured, angry, and likely watching from the shadows. Maybe it's alone, or maybe there are more of them lurking in the vast wilderness. I went back a few times, unofficially. Took different trails, left offerings of food, broken arrowheads, things I learned from old-timers who always said the deep woods held more than meets the eye. Seems crazy, I know, appeasing a monster. But out there, it's the unseen predators that are the most terrifying. Part of me hoped if I showed the creature respect, maybe it'd leave me and the others alone. But then again, part of me, part of me wanted a rematch. They shut down the lookout tower a few years back. Said it was unsafe, that the wood was rotting. But anyone who knows the area, knows that ain't the full story. They say it's best to leave some places undisturbed, let some mysteries stay mysteries. I tend to agree. Still, every time I drive past those mountains, part of me itches to go back, to follow those inhuman footprints into the wilds. See, the folks who call me crazy, they haven't felt the weight of that unnatural gaze. They don't know how quickly the world can flip into a darker place, where old maps fail, and the rules of predator and prey get rewritten. The wilderness, it's a beautiful place. But sometimes, there's more beauty in not knowing what lurks in the shadows. It keeps you humble, and it just might keep you alive. My name is Elias Harper, and this happened to me in October of 1994. I work as a park ranger in Mount Rainier National Park. I love to go off trail and explore. It's one of the perks of the job, and I always relish the solitude and the chance to discover pristine corners of my domain. I set off that morning with a destination in mind, Cougar Rock. It's a little-known outcrop, and the path leading to it has long been reclaimed by nature. It fit the bill perfectly for a leisurely off-trail trek. The only soul I encountered was old Mrs. Elmsley out walking her terrier. That brief, friendly exchange turned out to be the last human interaction I'd have that day. The hike was invigorating. I reached Cougar Rock just before noon and settled down for a quick lunch. The view was as spectacular as always and I lingered over a smoke after my sandwich, letting the peacefulness seep into my bones. Reluctantly, I got up and shouldered my backpack. Time to head back. Yet something felt different. The air seemed stiller than before, the silence somehow deeper. I brushed the strange feeling off. I started back on the overgrown path, a spring to my step. It was then I saw the first sign. An unusual pile of stones, not a cairn, just messily stacked up. I stopped, puzzled. There was no reason for anyone to place those stones there. I shrugged. Probably kids having some fun. Then something ahead caught my eye. A flash of red amidst the green, 
a discarded soft drinks can. It marred the untouched feel of the wilderness, and I frowned. People venturing off the beaten path always annoyed me, even if I was guilty of the same. I bent to pick it up, then froze. There was blood on the can, a smear of it dark and drying. An uneasy feeling washed over me. Had someone hurt themselves out here? Why hadn't they sought help? There was something else on the ground nearby. Half obscured by leaves, a scrap of dark cloth with a floral print. Fear pricked at the back of my mind. I backed away slowly, eyes searching the trees. Everything looked normal. Still lush and green, the birds chirping as always. But there it was again, a flicker of red between the trunks. I crept forward, heart pounding. A child's backpack lay on the ground, its contents scattered about. A half-eaten bag of gummy bears spilled out onto the leaves, an incongruously cheerful sight in the midst of my growing dread. There was no sign of its owner. A loud crunch behind me. I spun around, drawing my sidearm in one smooth movement. Nothing. Just the forest. The hair on my arms prickled. Was someone, or something, playing games with me? Hello? Anyone there? I shouted. My voice sounded small against the vastness of the trees. No answer, only that oppressive silence. I decided to make a beeline for the trail. No point playing cat and mouse in this maze of branches, not alone, not unarmed. I'd call it in, get a search party back here. As I moved I could swear I heard the soft pad of footsteps just behind me, muffled by the undergrowth. I whirled around again, but nothing. My mind swirled with horrible possibilities. There were plenty of missing persons cases in the park over the years, adults and children alike. Had I stumbled across something grim? Or was this something else? I didn't believe in the stories, the hushed whispers around campfires about strange creatures lurking in the depths of the forest, but fear doesn't care much about logic. Reaching the official trail felt like a victory. I nearly sprinted towards the parking lot, glancing over my shoulder every few seconds. The gnawing sense of being watched never lessened. Reaching my truck felt like the best moment of my life. I jumped in, slammed the door shut, and locked it. Staring out at the empty parking lot, I fumbled for my phone, hands shaking. Then I saw movement a dark shape slipping between the trees, heading back the way I had come. I blinked, and it was gone. There was only the forest. But I knew. There was something out there, something big, something dangerous, something hungry. And I was no longer alone. My report painted a bleak picture, a missing child, likely abducted. The search went into full swing the next morning. Teams descended upon the park, combing the area around Cougar Rock. I led one of the teams, my stomach churning with dread, knowing that we were probably too late. For days, we found nothing. No trace of the little girl, no clues hinting as to her fate. I couldn't sleep. The image of her backpack lying amongst blood-splattered leaves haunted my dreams. And always, the feeling that those unseen eyes were still watching me, taunting me from the shadows. Then came the break we all desperately needed, a grim one. A hiker on a remote trail found a child's shoe, torn and muddy. It was the same bright pink as the one I'd spotted scattered among the gummy bears. Fear turned to icy determination. We had at least a general area to focus on. The search intensified, with helicopters buzzing overhead and the whole damn National Guard arriving to supplement our numbers. Days turned into a blur of exhaustion, of trampling through thick undergrowth, of peering into the dark crevices between tree roots. It was on that fifth grueling day that I saw it again 
the flicker of movement, the hulking shape slipping between the trees. I charged after it, fueled by a mix of rage and desperation. The terrain was rough, the vegetation thick, but I pushed on. I stumbled, I fell, I cursed, but kept moving. And then, there it was in front of me. It was massive, easily twice my size. Its fur was matted and filthy, its eyes yellow and glowing with a malevolent light. Its teeth, bared in a snarl, were long and dagger-like. The sheer wrongness of the thing, the fact that it shouldn't exist yet somehow did, sent a primal scream up my throat. I fired in a panic, the gunshots echoing through the trees. One bullet hit its shoulder, eliciting a roar of pain and fury. It lunged at me. I threw myself back, out of reach of its monstrous claws. The impact with the ground knocked the wind from my lungs. I scrambled back, eyes locked on the creature. It was moving slowly now, blood trickling from its wound. I realized it was hurt, maybe badly. A surge of hope ignited within me. But then it changed direction. It turned and shambled away into the trees. My voice was a hoarse rasp. Follow it! Call in the helicopter! We hunted for hours, tracking the creature's bloody trail. It led us deeper into the forest, into parts of the park I'd never even heard of. Eventually, the trail led to a cave, a yawning maw in the mountainside. The bloodstains ended at the entrance. We regrouped at the cave mouth, armed to the teeth. We waited for the helicopter to arrive, its rotors thundering, its searchlights slashing through the gloom. When it finally did, we cautiously ventured inside, senses on high alert. The cave stank of rotten meat and something muskier, more primal. The floor was littered with bones, some too small for comfort. In the far back, illuminated by the helicopter's beam, lay a pile of clothing. The little girl's bright pink dress stood out like a beacon. That's when the creature chose to attack. It burst from a side tunnel, a blur of fury and claws. We opened fire, the gunshots deafening in the confined space. I saw it go down under the hail of bullets, the ground around it turning slick with blood. Yet, even as it finally lay still, I looked into those monstrous eyes and saw no surrender, no fear. It died hating us, and I knew deep down its kind would not rest. We never found the little girl's remains. We filled in the cave, burying the creature along with the shreds of the child's belongings. The official report listed her as dead, presumed victim of a bear attack. The truth, of course, was far more terrifying, far too impossible for anyone to believe. I stayed on at Mount Rainier for a few more years, always vigilant, a loaded shotgun a constant companion on even the shortest hikes. But thankfully, I never encountered another creature like it. Perhaps it was the last of its kind. Perhaps not. Even now, years later, retired to a quiet cabin on the other side of the country, I sometimes wake in a sweat, remembering those glowing eyes and that feeling of being relentlessly hunted. They say the park rangers always try to cover things up, that there are far more strange and unexplained deaths than ever reach the public. I couldn't say for sure. But I do know this. There are things out in those wilds beyond our understanding, creatures that lurk unseen just on the edge of our vision. And sometimes, just sometimes, we cross their path. And the aftermath is always tragic. My name is Cameron Wells, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I've been a park ranger in Yellowstone National Park for 15 years now. Married with two kids, a dog, the whole suburban bliss situation tucked into a corner of this wild place. 
You'd think I got used to it, to the scale of the wilderness and the secrets it holds. But the truth is, you never quite do. This particular day started like most others. Routine patrols through my assigned section of the park, checking for illegal campers, making sure those trail permits were in order. Yellowstone's a tourist magnet, but we tried to keep things as controlled as possible. I was nearing one of the more remote offshoots of the Pelican Valley when I spotted the carcass. A good few hundred feet off the trail, half obscured by bushes. Elk from the size of it. I frowned in annoyance. More paperwork if it turned out to be a poaching case. With a sigh, I radioed in my location and made my way towards it. Wolves were a possibility too, of course. It'd be good to know which, for the sake of the visitors. And then I saw the first sign that something was very, very wrong. No blood around the carcass. Not a drop. I stopped in my tracks, a chill creeping up my spine. I'm no greenhorn. I've seen my share of predator kills. This made no sense. The closer I got, the worse it became. The elk's bones were picked absolutely clean. No trace of meat, nor any sign of gnawing. It looked surgical, somehow. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end and then I caught a whiff of the rotten stench clinging to the remains. I gagged, my stomach churning. It wasn't the natural decay of carrion. It had a sickening sweetness to it, mixed with something metallic. I turned to leave when something massive exploded from the bushes behind me. I staggered from the impact, barely managing to avoid its lunge. I whipped around, my gun already in my hand, to see the thing. It was like nothing I'd ever encountered before. It stood on two legs, easily twice my height, its body lean and muscled in a way that was wrong. Skin stretched tight over bulging sinew, a sickly gray color. The head, disproportionately small atop its broad shoulders, had a skull-like appearance, and jaws that dripped with drool. Its eyes were milky white, no pupils, just empty orbs that seemed to stare right through me. Panic shot through me, hot and blinding. I fired off a shot, more out of instinct than anything else. The creature flinched back, making a hissing sound that made my teeth rattle. The second shot went wild, and then I was running. Running like my life depended on it, because it did. I heard it pounding after me the trees whipping by in a blur. At one point, its claws tore through my jacket, leaving burning gashes on my back. I stumbled, and the world tilted crazily, but I managed to keep myself upright. I finally burst through the tree line and onto the trail. A family out on a hike watched open-mouthed as I sprinted by, the creature hot on my heels. I screamed at them to run. They reacted a moment too late. The dad tried to put himself between his family and the thing, but it swiped him aside with ridiculous ease. His body crashed into a tree. I heard his wife scream. I kept running. Shots cracked behind me. The creature roared and abruptly changed course. I looked back just in time to see it lunge for one of the park cops the ones frantically responding to my mayday call. They barely had time to register what was happening before the creature was on them, and then it was a maelstrom of blood and screams and gunfire. I ran until my lungs threatened to burst. I ran until the sounds of carnage behind me faded, leaving an eerie silence in their wake. Eventually, I found a fallen log, half hidden by ferns, and crouched there, gasping for breath. The trembling wouldn't stop. For a long time, all I could do was try not to throw up and wait for rescue. I don't remember much of the next few hours. There was a helicopter, a field medic, and a whole lot of confused questions. I was in shock. 
The thing I saw, it shouldn't have been possible. Nobody believed my description, of course. Predator attack, they kept saying, maybe even a rogue grizzly. The incident made national news. For dead, a horrifying creature sighted by a hysterical ranger. In the end, it was dismissed as post-traumatic hallucinations. I was forced to undergo psych evaluations, put on temporary leave, all the while having nightmares about those empty eyes and razor-sharp claws. My family bore the brunt of it. The whispers when we went to the supermarket, the flinches whenever my kids made too much noise. My wife, Sarah, stood by me, fierce as a mama bear protecting her cubs, but I could see the stress in her eyes, the strain on our marriage. One night, I woke up screaming, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Sarah was by my side in an instant, soothing words spilling from her mouth even as she switched on the bedside lamp. And in the soft light, I noticed it. A thin, glistening trail of mucus on the pillow, and a strange, acrid smell clinging to my skin. I spent the rest of that night in the shower scrubbing myself raw trying to wash away the feeling of wrongness. In the morning, pretending to be fine, pretending not to notice Sarah's worried glances, I dug through my gear. Found my old hunting rifle, the one Grandpa taught me to shoot with back when I was just a kid. It felt heavy in my trembling hands. No way I was letting it come for my family, too. My resignation letter was the most difficult thing I ever wrote. Sarah didn't try to stop me. Just held me tight and whispered, Be careful. Then, with a last kiss for her and the kids, I got in my truck and drove. Back to Yellowstone. I found my way to that clearing near Pelican Valley, the place where it all began. The stench nearly made me lose my breakfast all over again. I steeled myself, the rifle held steady, and followed the putrid trail deeper into the woods. For a long time, it was like chasing shadows. Half-heard noises, glimpses of mottled gray disappearing behind the trees. Then I found another carcass, this one a deer, picked clean the same way as the elk. My rage exploded, grief fueling its fire. They should have believed me. They should have done something. I pushed forward, my movements growing less measured. The forest seemed to watch with an ancient sort of malice, the air charged with a crackling intensity that set my teeth on edge. I had no doubt I was the one being hunted now. And then there it was. Lounging in a clearing, the light filtering through the leaves casting strange patterns on its grotesque hide. The rage bubbled over. The thing lifted its skull-like head, its nostrils quivering. Before it could react, I aimed and fired. The roar of the rifle echoed, followed by a shriek of pain. The creature staggered, blood spraying the grass. It looked at me, those horrible eyes wide. Surprise flickered across them, maybe even fear? For a moment, the impossible dared to feel possible and then it charged. My second shot missed. My third lodged itself in its shoulder, slowing it just enough. I flung the rifle away and sprinted back towards the trees, the creature's enraged bellows filling the air behind me. Branches whipped my face, but I kept going. I scrambled up a gnarled old tree. I was high enough to see over the undergrowth when the creature finally came crashing into the clearing. It circled the base of the trunk, frustrated growls rumbling from its depths. My heart pounded so hard I was sure it would burst from my chest. We stayed like that for what felt like forever. Me perched precariously in a tree, the monster below, either of us willing to give an inch. As the light began to fade, the creature turned its empty eyes up towards me, and I felt the first trickle of despair. It wasn't going to leave. 
I was going to die up here, alone and forgotten. But then, a glimmer of movement in the distance caught my eye. A pack of wolves, at least six strong, slinking silently through the underbrush. They zeroed in on the creature. Something ancient flared in its expression then, a primal understanding passing between them. It turned, and with a last look in my direction, lumbered off into the woods. The wolves watched it go, and then, without a backward glance, disappeared back into the twilight. I didn't move for a long time, every muscle screaming in protest. Finally, with shaking legs, I climbed down. My journey back to my truck was a blur. Every rustle of leaves had me flinching, my hands slick with cold sweat. When I finally got home, Sarah just held me. No questions, just understanding and the scent of her familiar perfume washing over me. The nightmares lessened after that, fading into a dull, constant dread that was almost manageable. The resignation and relief warred within me. Park rangers are called to protect. But on some days, that means protecting the public from monsters that aren't supposed to exist. And sometimes, it means protecting the monsters from us. I never went back to my section of the park. Found a different line of work, something safer, something that didn't leave me haunted by empty white eyes and the sweet metallic stench of death. Not many can understand the aftermath. My scars run deep, seen clearly only by my wife and those who share a bond forged in the heart of Yellowstone's secrets. They say time heals all wounds. They're wrong. Some wounds mark you for life, reminders that the world is wilder and far more terrible than we dare imagine. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in August of 2001. I was a fresh-faced rookie park ranger assigned to Sequoia National Park. You gotta love that California sunshine, right? At least, that's what I thought until that fateful August day. My beat was a popular hiking trail, the Grizzly Falls Loop. Easy, well-marked, the kind you took the family on while Grandpa grumbled about the heat and the kids collected suspiciously shiny rocks. Not much scope for excitement, but a new ranger can't be picky, and it got me out among those magnificent trees. That day began like any other. I did the morning patrol, chased off some teenagers trying to carve their initials into a sequoia trunk, that sort of thing. On my second sweep of the trail, I came across a backpack tucked behind a bush. Someone had taken it off and forgotten it, apparently. Happens all the time. I gave it a shake, heard a rattling inside. Probably someone's stash of trail mix. Figuring I'd reunite the pack with its owner, I looked for ID. Found a half-full water bottle, a crumpled granola bar wrapper and a woman's wallet. I took the wallet out, flipped it open, and a chill ran down my spine. Inside, instead of the usual driver's license, there was a folded note with scrawled writing, Help me. He's watching. Don't go too far from the trail. Phone's dead. My first thought was a prank. Some idiot's idea of a good time, spooking the tourists. The more rational part of me, the new ranger part, knew better. You don't joke about someone being in danger, not in a national park with its share of disappearances each year. Protocol kicked in, sharp and insistent inside my head. I radioed in my location and a brief description of the backpack owner. Her name gleamed from the wallet. Dispatch promised to put out an alert on the missing woman. Meanwhile, I was told to stay put and wait for backup. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Every minute that passed could be the difference between saving someone and, well, not. With a silent apology to my superiors, 
I tucked the wallet back into the pack and stepped off the trail, carefully marking the spot with a couple of small stones. The woods felt different here. Greener, somehow, and quieter. Birdsong seemed absent. All I heard was the buzzing of insects. The underbrush was a tangle of branches and vines. Forcing my way through, I called out the woman's name. No answer. Just the rustling of leaves as I pushed ahead, and an odd, prickling sensation on my skin, like I was being watched. Suddenly, something dark zipped past the tree trunk up ahead. Too big for a squirrel. Too fast to be a deer. I stopped, heart pounding against my ribs. Logic battled with fear. Keep going was the logical call. The woman could be hurt, in need of help. But the fear, it whispered about predators, about how easily a lone ranger could disappear without a trace. I took a deep, steadying breath and went on. And then I saw the blood. Not much, just a few spatters on the leaves. I froze. My pulse thrummed a frantic tattoo inside my head. I drew my gun, scanning my surroundings. Nothing. The drop slid a short way off the impromptu trail I was following and ended. No body, no struggle marks. Had the woman been wounded and dragged away? The thought made my stomach turn. Right then, I heard a noise behind me. I turned my gun at the ready to see a kid. No more than six or seven years old, standing there, his face streaked with dirt and tears. But it wasn't the kid that sent a fresh jolt of horror through me. It was what loomed behind him, rising silently from the undergrowth. It was tall, at least seven feet, its body lean and impossibly long-limbed. The skin was a mottled greenish-brown, stretched tight over sinewy muscle. Its head was oddly elongated, almost snout-like, with teeth far too large for its narrow jaw. But its eyes, they were the worst. Yellow, pupilless, and filled with a chilling intelligence. The woman was right. It had been watching. The creature didn't advance immediately. It simply turned its head slightly and tilted those yellow eyes towards me. A sound rose in its throat, something halfway between a growl and a hiss. The kid, barely more than a toddler really, whimpered and clutched at his knees, burying his face against the filthy jeans. I aimed my gun. My finger trembled on the trigger. My legs were frozen to the ground, my mind a chaotic mess of predator instincts kicking in. I was outmatched physically, outgunned even if it came to that. But the kid, he was innocent, caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. I needed a distraction. Holstering my gun, I took a step back, raising my hands to show I meant no harm. My voice was shaky but clear. It's okay, buddy. I'm here to help. The creature twitched, its head tilting even further to the side as it studied me. Whether it understood my words, or merely sensed less of a threat, I couldn't tell. The kid finally peeked up from behind his knees his face a mix of fear and confusion. Easy now. I continued, my gaze locked on the creature. You want to take it slow. Just nod if you get me. Here's the deal. This thing. I struggled to find the right word. This critter doesn't like me much. I'll walk away, nice and slow. You stay here for a bit, then go back to the trail and shout for help, okay? The kid didn't nod, just blinked his big, tear-filled eyes at me. But I saw the flicker of comprehension there, and that was all I needed. Step by careful step, I retreated, keeping the creature in sight. Its gaze never left me, its body tense as a coiled spring. Relief washed over me when I reached the edge of the clearing. But just as I thought I was in the clear, the unthinkable happened. The kid let out a wail, part terror, 
part pure grief. And then he ran, not back towards the trail, but right towards the creature. I screamed a useless warning. In the space of a heartbeat, the creature had the boy in its grasp its long claws digging into the child's thin shirt. It hoisted him off the ground, his cries choked off by a massive, leathery hand clamping over his mouth. Pure, blinding fury erupted inside me. All thoughts of self-preservation vanished. Snatching up my gun again, I fired off a shot, then another. Both hit their mark, the creature flinching and letting out a roar of pain that rattled the leaves from the branches. Blood spattered dark and thick. I knew even then it wasn't enough. It just made the creature angry, its yellow eyes narrowing with a chilling malice. The boy dangled limply from one monstrous hand, his face an awful shade of blue. I charged forward, heedless of danger, firing wildly as I ran. I saw the creature's mouth open wide, those oversized teeth glinting in the dim green light. I heard a snap, a sickening crunch, followed by the small body dropping to the leaf-strewn ground. I don't know how many more times I fired before the creature turned and fled, its long limbs carrying it away with surprising speed. I was on my knees beside the boy a second later. But it was too late. Too late for him, too late for the note in the backpack pleading for help, too late for all of it. Rescue came swiftly. The Park Service helicopter, a team of armed rangers, even an investigative reporter from one of the local news stations. The incident blew up on social media, missing woman, mysterious creature sighting, dead child. I was questioned, scrutinized my actions analyzed to death. Technically, I violated protocol, jeopardized myself, and caused the death of an innocent child. None of that mattered. It never would. You see, the park kept it quiet, smothered the story under a veil of plausible deniability. Bear attack, mountain lion maybe, the boy tragically got separated from his mother who was, of course, never found. It's safer that way. Better for the tourist numbers. Better for everyone who wants to believe the national parks are just pristine slices of the great outdoors, untouched by real darkness. I quit my job, of course. Took up a new one behind a desk, in a city where the biggest predators are made of concrete and steel. They changed the beat assignments in Sequoia. No ranger goes out solo on the Grizzly Falls Trail anymore. I still wonder sometimes if it would have made any difference. The aftermath, they call it. For me, there's no such thing. Every night, I see the boy, lifeless in the creature's grasp. I hear his screams cut short. I smell the blood and the sharp, feral scent of the thing that took him. The worst part is, I know they're out there. The things that exist just beyond the well-lit paths. The things that lurk in the shadows of the ancient trees. Every rustle of leaves in the park across the street from my apartment is a threat. Every missing pet poster is a grim reminder. And most days, hidden by the din of city life, is the bone-deep certainty that someday, those pupilless yellow eyes will find me. It's not the dramatic horror stories that haunt you the most the ones with fang monsters and blood-splattered walls. It's the simple tragedies, the quiet terrors, the ones that leave you staring at the empty silence long after the lights go out. That's the aftermath I carry every day. My name is Declan Murphy and this happened to me in September of 2016. I'm a backcountry ranger in Yellowstone National Park and have been for almost 10 years. Married, two young kids, and a mortgage, the whole domestic dream out here in the wilds. You forget sometimes how big the wild really is, 
and the stuff that can dwell in its shadows. We'd been getting reports of weird encounters near the Pelican Valley. Sightings of a strange, lanky creature. Spooked hikers, an elk carcass with no sign of a predator around it. My partner, Vanessa, she thought it was probably some mangy wolf, but something about the reports made my skin crawl. I volunteered to go check it out. The first day out there, I saw nothing unusual. Typical stuff, bison herds, some bear tracks, the usual flock of overly confident tourists with selfie sticks. When dusk crept in, I found a sheltered spot up on a ridge and set up my small camp. Figured I might have a better chance of spotting whatever it was under the cover of darkness. Turns out, I didn't even have to look for it. It found me. Sitting by the campfire, eating some beef jerky, I heard a twig snap somewhere off to my right. I froze and peered out into the gloom of the woods. All I could see was the faint outline of trees and the flicker of the fire reflecting in two, unblinking eyes set high above the ground. My heart pounded in my chest, and I slowly, carefully reached for my gun. Those weren't any kind of animal eyes I knew of. The creature stepped out of the darkness. It was tall, easily eight feet, its body rail thin and covered in greenish-gray skin. Its limbs looked impossibly long, ending in sharp claws. The head was, the head was the nightmare stuff. Narrow and skull-like, with a wide jaw filled with a mess of jagged teeth. The worst part had to be the eyes. Yellow, without pupils, staring at me with something that felt coldly intelligent. It stood there, not moving, just watching. I could hear the blood rushing in my ears. Everything about it screamed wrong. Its proportions were inhuman, its presence a violation of the natural order I'd grown accustomed to. Get out of here! I found my voice shaky but clear. This is my territory. Probably dumb, saying that to some predator from out of a folktale. But you get desperate talking to whatever part of your brain still believes in reason. The creature didn't react. It just tilted its head to one side, like a bird listening for a worm underground. My hand tightened around my gun, finger hovering near the trigger. Then it happened. Out of the darkness came a woman, stumbling towards my campfire. She was bruised, her clothes torn. Please help! She croaked, her voice a ragged whisper. He, it, it's been after me for days. Then she saw the creature in the shadows, and pure terror flared across her face. She turned and ran. And the creature, it moved like a blur, inhumanly fast, snatching her out of the darkness. Her screams were cut short, replaced by a horrifying crack followed by an awful wet, crunching sound. I could smell the blood, heavy and coppery on the evening air. The clearing was silent again, except for the crackle of my campfire. The creature had vanished, melted back into the trees as if it were never there. I sat there for what felt like forever, my gun clutched in numb fingers, waiting for it to lunge at me from the trees. It never did. I reported the incident, of course. My official statement was full of dry facts, missing person, likely mountain lion attack, search team dispatched. They looked at me like I was either drunk or shell-shocked, but there wasn't much to be done. We swept the area, found, well, let's just say the cleanup wasn't for the faint of heart. No trace of the creature ever turned up. It had hunted, killed, and simply vanished. I still patrol that area occasionally. Sometimes, I swear I feel those yellow eyes on me, lurking just beyond the reach of my flashlight, studying me. Other rangers have started to hear the stories, the whispers of something else in those woods. They mostly brush it off, or make sly jokes about me needing to lay off the whiskey. 
Vanessa, bless her heart, worries. Says I should change beats, that it isn't worth the risk. I think of my kids, and that empty spot in the forest waiting for anyone unlucky enough to stumble into it. So I keep going back. I carry a bigger rifle now, and an extra flashlight. Park protocol frowns on setting traps, so I make do with what I have. I haven't run into it since that night, but I haven't found any new elk carcasses either. Part of me believes it's still out there, watching and waiting. My name is Maya Ortiz, and this happened to me in August of 2008. I'm a ranger at Yosemite National Park, and I've been here my whole life, so you think I'd know better. Then again, maybe growing up surrounded by mountains, trees, and the occasional grumpy bear makes you forget there's a whole different kind of dangerous out there. I was patrolling a stretch of the Pohono Trail, a popular, well-marked route with views so scenic tourists act like they're the first to ever discover its wonders. Cell reception dies out fast in this part of the park, especially once you're deeper into the woods. We all carry radios, of course, standard procedure. That day, I'd opted to go on foot rather than take one of the patrol jeeps. Sometimes you just want the quiet, you know? A while in, I came across an old leather backpack, abandoned beside the trail. Seemed odd. Nobody goes hiking without the essentials. I figured some tourist had forgotten it, so I picked it up. It was worn and heavy, like it had been well used. I unbuckled the flap and saw a notebook. On the first page, a girl's name, Emily. Underneath that, a scribbled note in a panicked hand, asterisk don't let it take me. Keep moving, don't stay still too long. It can see you. Asterisk. My pulse quickened. Probably a dumb prank. Bored kids messing with hikers. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Emily's words had a raw urgency to them. Curiosity, and maybe a touch of that ranger protectiveness, got the better of me. I decided to follow the trail a bit further see if I could find any sign of the owner. After all, maybe she needed help. The trees thickened, blocking out most of the sunlight, creating a patchwork of shadows on the ground. I kept a sharp eye out for any sign of disturbance, broken branches, footprints that weren't mine. Nothing. That nagging sense of unease was growing, settling heavy in my stomach like a bad meal. The woods felt heavy, watchful, wrong. That's when I saw it. A flash of movement in my peripheral vision. I whipped around, hand resting on the butt of my gun. Nothing there, just the gnarled trunks of old pines and an overgrown carpet of ferns. But I knew it saw me too. I radioed for backup, voice strained but steady. I described Emily's backpack, the note, my location. Dispatch sounded skeptical, but said they'd alert the nearest unit. Meanwhile, I was on my own. I pushed ahead, the forest growing denser, the air heavy with the scent of pine needles and wet earth. Then I smelled something else, sickly sweet and copper tangy under it. Blood. I stopped abruptly, scanning the undergrowth. On a moss-covered rock lay a man's flannel shirt, torn and stained a dark, horrible red. My stomach lurched. He hadn't just gotten lost. He was probably... A noise behind me. A crackle of dead leaves, a faint, rasping breath. I spun, gun raised, expecting to see... Well, I wasn't sure what. A bear, maybe though nothing explained that blood. There it stood, just beyond a tangle of thick bushes. Towering, at least seven feet tall, its body impossibly thin and lanky. 
skin stretched tight over bulging muscles and bone, a sickly pale color mottled with darker patches. The head, it had a muzzle, like a dog's but longer, filled with needle-like teeth. But the worst were the eyes. Large, yellow, and entirely blank. No recognition, no flicker of animal instinct. Just a chilling, empty intelligence. Panic surged through me, the urge to run pounding in my ears. But I held my ground, hands trembling but steady on my gun. This thing, it was hunting. It expected me to run, to become the prey. My voice came out as a hoarse whisper. Get back! This is my park. Stupid maybe, but there was a kind of defiance in it that even surprised myself. The creature tilted its head, let out a low, rasping hiss. Then it tensed those long, spidery limbs flexing as if ready to pounce. A gunshot split the air. The creature jolted back, a dark splatter of blood appearing on its flank. From the undergrowth, my partner, Noah, burst out, his rifle smoking. It howled, an unholy mix of pain and fury. In the split second it was distracted, I turned and ran. Noah and I didn't stop running until we were well clear of that patch of woods. Backup arrived shortly, and they searched the entire area. No trace of the creature was ever found, and of Emily, just the notebook I'd kept tucked in my pocket as grim proof. That night, over lukewarm takeout, Noah and I made the unspoken decision to stick to the heavily populated trails. No amount of paperwork, or official reprimand, was worth risking another encounter. They hushed it up, of course. A cougar attack that left the victim unrecovered, that sort of digestible lie for public consumption. The backpack remained unclaimed and lost and found, gathering dust. Sometimes, I wonder about Emily. Did she escape, or become a chilling statistic in the park's long history of missing persons? Some nights, lying in the safety of my cabin with its reassuringly solid walls, I imagine the forest stretching out beyond the edge of my flashlight beam. And in the deepest shadows, I think I see a flicker of inhuman movement, and a pair of glowing, unblinking eyes staring back. My name is Ethan Keller, and this happened to me in September of 2012. I've been a ranger in Olympic National Park for a little over five years now. Love the rainforests, the remoteness, most of the time. Makes you feel like you've stepped into another world entirely. But there's remote, and then there's the deep ho rainforest. Miles of old-growth trees dripping with moss, thick underbrush the kind of place where sunlight barely filters through and getting lost is terrifyingly easy. I was assigned to trail maintenance there, a routine two-day job meant to be tackled alone. Routine, at least, by ranger standards. My first day on the job went about as smoothly as cutting back vines and overgrowth can get. By evening, I'd set up camp in a small clearing near the river, cooked myself a freeze-dried dinner, and settled down with my headlamp and a paperback to unwind before bed. That's when I heard it. Not a bear, not a cougar, not the usual symphony of forest critters settling in for the night. It was something like a sob, choked and desperate, followed by a scuffling sound in the undergrowth. Now protocol is clear. Civilians in trouble, that's when you intervene. But rangers out in the back country? You tread lightly, respect the wilderness for what it is. Still, there was something about that sound. I grabbed my rifle, clicked off the safety, and headed in the direction of the noise. The ferns and fallen leaves muffled my footsteps, making the forest seem even quieter after the strange cry. Every creaking branch had me on edge. 
Up ahead, something thrashed in a thicket of thorny vines. Hello? Anyone there? I called out, my voice hoarse in the quiet. No answer. Just an odd rustling sound, followed by a flash of movement deeper in the darkness. I took a cautious step forward. And that's when the thing pounced. It knocked me clean off my feet, a blur of sinewy limbs and foul-smelling fur. I hit the wet ground with a grunt, rifle skidding away. I got a glimpse of clawed hands too long for a bear. And the teeth, rows of them, pointed and yellow. But all I really remember are the eyes. Big, amber, and burning with a hate that felt, well, not just animal. It let out a blood-curdling screech and lunged from my throat. I rolled away, fumbling desperately in the damp leaves for my rifle. I found it, twisted as much as I dared with the thing so close, and took a shot. More out of instinct than anything else. The thing recoiled with a howl, a spray of blood marking the tree behind it, but it wasn't down. It circled me, panting heavily, its eyes locked on me like prey. That's when I saw it clearly. Too skinny to be a bear, yet strong enough to have taken a grown man down. Skin stretched over prominent ribs, patchy in places and mottled a sickly brown. The head was almost dog-like, but elongated, and filled with far too many teeth. It stalked me like a predator, but there was more there. An intelligence that set my teeth on edge. I fired again. It flinched, then scrambled further into the undergrowth, vanishing in seconds amidst the shadows of the trees. Shaking, I got to my feet, my heart pounding like a war drum. I had to get out of there. Radioing in to report the incident was met with predictable skepticism. It took three days, a team of rangers armed to the teeth, and an awful lot of blood splatter on the forest floor before they believed what I saw out there. They never found the, the creature. Said it must have been a sick bear, or maybe a coyote with mange, playing mind games with me. I transferred shortly after that. Took a desk job up in Seattle. I haven't even liked going on hikes lately, the trees closing in too tight. But every now and then... At night, when the city noise subsides, I swear I hear that screech again. And then I see those eyes, glowing in the darkness just beyond my window. My name is Elias Harper, and this happened to me in October of 1994. I work as a park ranger in Mount Rainier National Park. I love to take long patrols in the woods, soaking up the sounds and the feeling of such wild places. It's part of why I took this job. One thing I never liked was getting called out late at night, especially for missing person reports. It always seemed like the lost person waited until the darkest hours to fall off a trail or wander into the wilderness. Still, it's the job, so complaining won't get me out of it. This particular report arrived a little past eleven at night. A couple had been camping and their friend, an older woman named Tabitha Caldwell, had gone out for an evening walk two hours ago and hadn't come back. Now, they weren't too concerned when she didn't return right away. Tabitha was an experienced hiker and knew the area but after those two hours ticked by, they started to worry. I met the couple, Daniel and Sandra, back at their campsite. The woman was a bit hysterical, but that often happened with these situations. I assured them we'd do everything we could to find their friend. They described Tabitha to me gray hair, short build, blue windbreaker, walking stick. I took down a few more details about where she'd said she was going, but it was vague. Just a mention of a trailhead she wanted to find on an old map she'd brought with her. Now, there are a lot of trails in Mount Rainier, 
some poorly marked, others long overgrown. The fact she was relying on an old map didn't make me hopeful. I radioed back to the main station to deploy a search team, but warned them it might take a while to find a starting point. I told Daniel and Sandra to stay at their campsite in case Tabitha found her way back, and I started driving back down the access road toward where I thought the trailhead might be. Rain started to fall, light at first and then a steady downpour, the kind that turns the road muddy and slick. I found the overgrown trailhead where I expected it, but now I had zero visibility, the rain obscuring even my high beams. It was a bad night. Worse, I had a gnawing feeling this wasn't a typical missing person case. I stepped out of the truck. The wind whipped the rain around, and a branch cracked loudly in the woods. I yelled out, Tabitha? Tabitha Caldwell, can you hear me? Only the rustling trees answered. I followed the trail as best I could, the rain turning the ground into mush. It was slow going, and more than once I had to backtrack after losing the thin line of flattened brush marking the path. Tabitha wasn't a spring chicken, but even with the storm, she shouldn't have been too far from here. And if she'd gotten seriously hurt, there should be a sign of a struggle, something other than this steady downpour. I started calling her name more often, my voice hoarse. Nothing. An hour and a half in, I was soaked to the bone and that nagging feeling had twisted itself into a hard knot in my stomach. This felt wrong, all of it. I was about to turn back to report a lack of progress when I saw it. A flicker of blue against the trees. That damned windbreaker. I jogged towards it and almost tripped over something wet and yielding beneath my feet as I got closer. Tabitha's walking stick lay on the ground. I picked it up, then knelt down next to. I couldn't describe it well even if I wanted to. Not then, and not now. A shred of blue fabric was visible, and the rest was pulp. No, not even that word does it justice. There was a mass of mangled flesh, shredded clothing, streaks of blood washed down the trail by the rain. It wasn't a sight compatible with any sane idea of the natural world. It was pure nightmare fuel. Panic flared up, a hot, tight sensation in my chest. I had my pistol, but whatever did this wasn't something a gun would help with. No animal, nothing I'd ever learned about, could do this to a human being. I stumbled backwards, tripping over a root, and landed hard in the mud. Still, with my eyes fixed on that horror, I scrambled back further until the trees obscured the sight. I got to my feet and ran. I have no idea if I was still on the trail or just crashing through the woods. Branches whipped my face, the rain stung my eyes, I probably tripped and fell a dozen times, but I didn't care. Get away, that was the only thought in my head. I had to get away, to the truck, to call for backup. This wasn't a simple missing person anymore, if it ever had been. There was something out here, something dangerous, something I didn't even have words to describe. Then I heard it. A crack like a gunshot behind me. My heart seized up. I pushed myself harder, but every rustling of leaves... Every groan of wind-blown trees sounded monstrous to my ears. Something was back there, was it following? Finally, with lungs burning and legs screaming, I burst out onto the gravel road. My truck was there, blessedly there, doors standing open in my haste. I scrambled for the radio, my fingers clumsy, and then the voice was in my ear. Elias, this is dispatch. You okay? We've got teams ready to deploy, but we can't get a hold of. I couldn't speak clearly at first, just gasped out words in a breathless rush. Something not an animal found Tabitha. Get help, lot of help. 
My grip tightened on the radio. Armed help. There was a long pause on the other end. Then, a different voice came through, one I recognized as the chief ranger. Elias, calm down. What did you find? Describe it. I did the best I could, even knowing my description would sound insane. I'd sound insane. But there was no way in hell I was going back in those woods alone, and I knew I wouldn't convince anyone to follow me if I didn't at least try to explain what I'd seen. And then, then I saw it. A towering shape, taller than any man, moving through the trees at the edge of the road. It was barely visible in the stormy darkness, but I saw its long, inhuman limbs, the slick wetness of its skin, and those eyes, those eyes glowing in the faint light filtering through the rain. I screamed at the radio. There! It's there! Send help, send help! My cry was cut short as the thing launched itself from the trees, moving with uncanny speed. One massive hand slammed into the truck's door before I could even shut it, metal groaning and bending against some terrible strength. Inside, it was chaos. I fumbled for my pistol, but my seatbelt was tangled, and the creature was wrenching at the warped door with horrific, tearing sounds. The side window exploded inward, showering me with glass. I fired blindly, the noise deafening in the confined space. I don't know if I even hit anything it simply recoiled for a moment— then shoved its upper body through the shattered window. I can't describe that face properly. There was a mouth, too wide, too full of sharp teeth, but the eyes, they were the worst. Intelligent, but not the way any human or even animal eyes are. Those flat, yellow eyes held a focused hunger and a kind of cruel amusement. I grabbed at the radio, smashing it against the creature's leathery skin as I scrambled out the passenger side door. Mud slicked under my boots as I ran, my gunshots echoing behind me. They hadn't stopped it. How do you stop something like that? I didn't look back until reaching the main road, my lungs aflame and my heart hammering in my ears. Back there, the truck was a twisted wreck, but there was no sign of the creature. Had my shots driven it off? Or, or was it watching, just biding its time? Suddenly, headlights broke through the storm. Blessed headlights. I flagged them down, a forestry service vehicle. Backup had arrived. Two rangers, Carl and Joanna, jumped out, alarmed. Their questions blurred together in those adrenaline-fueled moments. My words sounded frantic even to myself. The words, creature, and not human, tumbling out. I pointed a shaking finger back down the road, trying to describe those eyes, the unnatural movements. Carl looked skeptical, but Joanna had a different expression, one I recognized. Fear. Her father, a ranger before her, disappeared on a night patrol almost a decade ago. They never found him. Get in, Elias, she said, her voice firm. We piled into their truck, and Carl slammed the pedal down, headed towards my wrecked cruiser. We didn't see anything on the road. Maybe it fled deeper into the woods, or maybe it was never there at all, just a figment in my terror-addled mind. Back at the station, I was a mess. Blood spattered from the broken window shivering from delayed shock. They made me repeat my story over and over, each time to a different grim-faced ranger. Some looked skeptical, others listened with the same hard glint in their eyes as Joanna. The chief ranger, a man named Frank, finally pulled me aside into a small office. Elias, he said, I believe you think you saw something, something that did this to Tabitha. He gestured to a file on the desk. I saw gruesome photos of what they'd found on the trail. But we've never had anything like this in the park. 
Predators, sure, but nothing that does that. Sir, I said, my voice raspy. It wasn't animal. I know what I saw. It was intelligent, and it was enjoying dash. I cut myself off, unable to say it again. Stress does things to your mind, son, he said, not unkindly. You did good getting help when you did. Now you need to rest. The next few weeks are a blur. Suspension from duty. A mandatory psych evaluation. The cold stares of other rangers who thought I'd cracked under pressure. And always, at night, those eyes burned in the darkness behind my eyelids. The tearing metal and the scent of something foul and old. The investigation continued. Search teams combed every inch of the forest near where I'd encountered it, finding nothing. Tabitha's remains were DNA identified. Her friends, Daniel and Sandra, returned to their lives, shadowed by grief that might never find proper closure. Officially, her death was listed as an animal attack, but I know the rangers that saw the photos don't believe that anymore. A month passed. The nightmares didn't fade, the gnawing sense of unease only grew. Every creak of my apartment floorboard, every shadow just a bit too dark, turned into that creature waiting. And deep down, I know it was. One morning, Joanna called. Her voice was strained. Elias, it happened again. Two hikers, missing since last night. Search found, well... It's like Tabitha all over again. Same area of the park. They think it's the same thing? I asked. The silence was answer enough. Frank wants us to go in there. Armed. Tonight, she said. He's setting up a team. Only ones who believe you. I have to go, Elias. My dad. Her voice hitched. Then she continued firmly. Will you? I should have refused. The logical, sane part of me screamed to run far away and never look back. But another part, a part fueled by anger and a bone-deep need to see this end, that part said yes. That night, we gathered at the station four of us total. Frank, Joanna, me, and a younger ranger named Ben who had grim determination etched onto his face. Our gear wasn't standard issue, not just pistols, but heavier firepower and specialized flashlights. Frank had even called in some kind of tracking expert from outside the park. We entered the forest at dusk, armed and wary. The tracking expert, a wiry man named Rowan, took point. He moved like a ghost, reading signs on the ground I couldn't even see. The further in we went, the closer to the place where I found Tabitha, the more that unease gnawed at me, twisting my gut. Rowan stopped suddenly, holding up a fist to halt us. He crouched down, pointing. In the faint beam of his flashlight, I made out a track, not from any animal I knew. It was too big for a human, the toes too splayed. We followed that track for what felt like hours the forest closing in around us with stifling darkness. Finally, just as I felt on the verge of snapping, Rowan hissed. There. Ahead, through the tangle of ancient trees, I saw a pale shape hunched over something in a small clearing. The thing raised its head as we approached, and even from a distance, I recognized those flat, yellow eyes. It stood, dropping the shredded mess that had once been a person. A low, rumbling growl rose from its throat. We opened fire. The night erupted in gunfire and muzzle flash, the creature roaring in what might have been pain or pure fury. It lumbered towards us, faster than it should have been able to, but the shots were taking their toll. It stumbled, one of its massive legs buckling. It still didn't fall, but something shifted in that moment. We were gaining ground. Then it turned and crashed back into the undergrowth, disappearing into the night. We followed for as long as we could, 
but the trail went cold. It had vanished, leaving only the bloody proof of its hunger behind. Aftermath, that night changed everything. The creature wasn't a figment of my fear. It was horrifyingly real. Yet, officially, the attacks were listed as undetermined, with no mention of anything unusual. They covered it up for the sake of the park's reputation, to avoid mass panic. It still makes me sick to think about, but I understand why. The rest of us, the ones who saw, we kept patrolling, always watchful, always waiting for it to strike again. It did sometimes. A missing person here, a gruesome find there. Sometimes we'd drive it off, sometimes, if it was hungry enough, it would claim another victim. I never got over the guilt of not being able to stop it. Joanna married Ben, found some semblance of a normal life despite the shadow hanging over them. Frank retired, his age finally catching up to him, but I don't think he ever slept soundly again. As for me, I'm still a ranger in Mount Rainier, despite everything. Can't explain why, not really. Maybe an obsession, a need to be here in case it returns. Maybe I'm simply waiting for the night those yellow eyes find me in the dark once more. My name is Caleb Ross, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I'm a National Park Ranger in Redwood National Forest in Northern California. It's a damn beautiful place, if you don't mind damp moss and towering trees that block out the sun for most of the day. Still, I love the peace of it, the way the forest muffles the world. Always felt more at home here than anywhere else, even that rundown apartment I had back in town. This happened a couple years after losing my wife in a car accident. Figured that's why I buried myself even deeper in this work. Reckon I wasn't doing the best job of healing. But that's a whole different story. This one, it ain't about grief. It's about something a whole lot less human. September is the best time for backpacking in the redwoods. Still warm fewer crowds after the summer tourists. I get a lot of requests for backcountry permits, and it's part of the gig to check in with folks starting long trails, make sure they're geared up right. This group was three guys, mid-thirties, looked fit, outdoors the types. Nay tags on their packs said Brandon, Kevin, and Marcus. Standard questions got maps, compass, first aid. They seemed experienced, although something about them made me uneasy. Not anything clear, just a prickle on the back of my neck. I warned them about mountain lions in the area. Hadn't been a serious attack in a few years, but it's standard info. Marcus, the biggest of the bunch, gave a cocky grin. We brought protection, he said, patting his hip. Good, I said, trying not to sound concerned. I don't like guns in the park, but some folks think they're a magic shield against danger. Next morning I was on patrol when I got an emergency call garbled, cuts in and out. Sounded like Brandon, hysterical, yelling about something attacking them in the night. I asked for their location, but got only a choked. By the big redwood. And then the call dropped. Every ranger's worst nightmare. Now, a group of hikers is out there, injured, maybe worse, and my job is to find them. I radioed it in, got a whole search team mobilized, and drove like a man and to the trailhead where the guys had said they were starting. The hike to their last known location was a grueling few hours through dense underbrush. I called their names until my throat was raw, the woods echoing back only the rustle of leaves. We finally found their campsite, or what was left of it. Tents were shredded, gear scattered like some giant beast had played with it. Blood smeared on a broken tree branch, and an overturned cooking pot half-crushed, 
like it was made of paper. A flash of panic hit me then. If this was a mountain lion attack, it was a bad one, and we were woefully unprepared to face that kind of aggression. I touched the butt of my pistol, wishing I had something stronger. The search team was too spread out I had to get everyone moving closer before sundown. That's when I saw the footprints. These weren't from any animal I recognized. They were huge, each toe splayed wide, and there was something freakishly elongated about the shape of the heel. Alongside those prints were drag marks, a wide gouged line in the damp earth. Like something heavy was hauled away. My blood ran cold. Whatever this was, it wasn't natural. I looked at the shredded tents, imagining the terror those guys must have felt. I yelled for the backup team, my voice tight with urgency. They came, armed park rangers with pale, grim faces. None of us voiced what we were starting to suspect, but I saw it in their eyes. We followed the tracks as the sun dipped lower. The forest here grows freakishly dense. Redwood trunks as wide as cars, branches knitted so tight they form a living ceiling. The air grew still, and then I smelled it. Like rotten meat left too long in the summer heat, mixed with something musky and feral. A twig snapped up ahead. My heart pounded. I held up a closed fist, signaling the others to halt. We moved closer, rifles raised, breaths held. Then it stepped out from behind a redwood so monstrous its roots were like a small cave. The thing was tall, easily eight feet at the shoulder, moving with a lumbering, lopsided gait. Its skin was leathery and mottled, some places bare and others with clumps of coarse black hair. The arms were too long, ending in thick claws that ripped up the ground as it walked. But the worst was the head. Humanoid, but warped a muzzle pushed forward, too many teeth in a mouth that stretched far too wide. Its eyes, small and beady, held a glimmer of intelligence that made my stomach churn. It turned, sniffing the air, and those eyes locked onto ours. For a frozen second, we just stared at each other, and my survival instincts screamed at me to run. But if those guys were still alive, we had to try, had to distract this thing. Marcus had been right about one thing they brought protection. We opened fire. The noise in the enclosed space was deafening, echoing off the ancient trees. I don't know how many shots hit their mark, but the creature let out a roar that shook the ground. It thrashed for a moment, then spun and crashed back into the undergrowth disappearing with startling speed for something so bulky. I ordered two of the rangers to follow it, tried to keep it in sight without getting too close. I told them to fire warning shots in the air, try and drive it back toward the main park roads where heavier backup waited. The rest of us began a desperate search for the missing hikers. The light was fading fast by the time we found the first body. It was Kevin, or what was left of him. The scene was... I won't describe it in detail. Let's just say that whatever this thing was, it didn't kill the way a cougar or a bear would. There was a monstrous cruelty to it. We found Brandon an hour later, barely alive, huddled beneath the upturned root system of a fallen tree. His eyes were wide with terror, but he was whispering a single word over and over again. Wendy go. Wendy go. I knew that word. Old Native American legends. A spirit of hunger, of insatiable greed, sometimes possessing men, sometimes a creature all on its own. Stories to scare kids around a campfire, not something you'd ever expect to be real. But there Brandon lay, broken and bleeding, proof that those campfire tales had teeth. There wasn't time to dwell on it. He was in bad shape. We got him stabilized and onto a stretcher with the remaining light, carrying him back to the trailhead, a grim procession in the twilight. 
Every rustle in the trees made me jump, expecting that monstrous shape to emerge from the darkness. Back at the station, medics swarmed Brandon, but it was too late. His wounds were horrific, but I think the shock killed him just as much as his injuries. Before slipping away, he kept mumbling that name, the name we didn't dare speak aloud. The rangers left to chase the creature were still out there. I wanted to join them, to hunt that thing down, but my duty was to stay at the station, coordinate the response. I couldn't sleep. The image of Kevin's savage body burned into my brain. Around three in the morning, the radios crackled. It was one of the tracking rangers, his voice high with panic. We've lost it. Damn thing circles back like it knows we're following. Sarge wants backup, heavy firepower. Something in me snapped. I grabbed one of the heavier rifles, ignoring the surprised shouts from the other rangers. Rules be damned, there was no way I was sitting this out. The drive back to the trailhead was a blur. The other search team had regrouped, grim faces, eyes darting into the woods, rifles drawn tight across their bodies. Their sergeant, a grizzled veteran named Ben, outlined the situation. They'd managed to drive the creature a good distance, but it never left the forest. It knew the terrain better than them, and every time they thought they had it cornered, it vanished. This thing isn't just an animal, Ben grunted. It's cunning. We split into smaller teams, fanning out to cut off possible escape routes. Tracking was easier in the dark, weirdly enough. Its footprints were massive and disturbed the vegetation. But following those tracks, it led us deeper into the heart of the forest, into places where the redwoods grew tangled and the canopy blotted out all but the faintest moonlight. The thing wanted to play a game, lure us in. But we had no choice if we wanted to stop it to prevent it from finding more victims outside the park. I clung to that thin thread of determination, the only thing keeping the overwhelming dread at bay. Suddenly, the ranger ahead of me, a young guy named Ethan, let out a choked scream. I rushed forward, and he pointed a shaking hand at the ground. There, illuminated by his flashlight, was Marcus' body. No, not the whole body. Just the legs, and that damn name tag still clipped to his shredded backpack. I felt bow rise in my throat. This wasn't animal behavior, it wasn't even sadism. This was a message, a display of power, of cruel intelligence. Terror threatened to paralyze me, but then a hot wave of anger washed through me, replacing the ice of fear. Let's keep moving. I said, my voice steadier than I felt. The others nodded, faces grim. We pushed forward, the silence broken only by the soft crunch of boots on pine needles and our ragged breaths. Hours passed. Dawn began to paint streaks of gray through the canopy. The track we followed twisted and turned, sometimes doubling back, almost like the creature was toying with us. Exhaustion gnawed at me. But just when I thought I couldn't take another step, the trees ahead thinned out. We'd reached a clearing. And there in the center, bathed in the first rays of morning light, was the creature. It sat hunched over something torn and bloody, too engrossed in its gruesome feast to have noticed us yet. We took positions, encircling the clearing. I raised my rifle, my hand trembling slightly and aimed for the monstrous head. The creature looked up, a snarl twisting its inhuman lips, revealing those rows of blood-stained teeth. Then it tossed the remnants of its meal aside and stood, rising to its full nightmarish height. Fire! Ben shouted, and the clearing erupted in a cacophony of gunfire. I emptied my magazine, the recoil punching my shoulder with each shot. The creature roared thrashing, but it kept coming straight for us. 
one by one, rifles fell silent as the rangers reloaded. My gun clicked uselessly empty. The creature lunged toward Ben, and in that split second, Ethan threw himself in its path. I still have nightmares about what followed. The sickening sound of breaking bones, Ethan's scream, abruptly cut short. Then the creature was on me. I barely had time to raise the rifle to block a swipe of its claws. The impact sent me flying, a flash of white-hot pain in my arm. I scrambled back, fumbling with my pistol, as the creature stalked closer, yellow eyes blazing. And then, an ear-splitting shotgun blast from behind me. The creature staggered backward, a chunk of its shoulder blasted out in a spray of gore. Ben, one-armed, ejected the spent shell and loaded with lightning speed. Another blast, this one hitting the creature square in its barrel-like chest. It roared, clawing at the wound, then seemed to waver, a flicker of confusion in those hateful eyes. The opening was enough. I fired my pistol again and again. The other rangers rallied, joined in, bullets peppering the creature's leathery hide. Finally, with a last shuddering roar, it collapsed to the ground. Aftermath, in the silence that fell, you could hear the sobs of grown men. It was over, but the cost. We lost three good rangers that day. My arm was messed up, took over a year of physical therapy to get full use back. Official report? Bear attack. Cover up, just like every other time something like this happens. We swore an oath of secrecy, about the Wendigo, about the truth. Some of us never really recovered. Ben quit not long after, couldn't bear being in the forest anymore. Others, like me, we stayed. What else was there to do? Monsters are real, they lurk in the deepest shadows, but life continues, and someone has to stand guard. There's no tidy ending to this. Every creak of my floorboards at night, every rustling of wind in the trees— Sounds like claws and whispers and promises of a hunger that can never be sated.